Coming up on this, this episode of Brody Even Talk Pinball, we're talking pinball with Mark Silk, voice actor from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, many other TV shows and movies that you know. Recently announced Led Zeppelin, the uh, end of Replay FX and Papa, and uh, some Raza commentary for your Christmas gift from us. All the more coming right up. Double Super Jackpot! And now, the Hall and Oates of Pinball Podcasting, Nick Lane and Kevin Manny of Buffalo Pinball. Whoa, boom shakalaka. Oh, it's us. What's going on? And it's December, and we're doing another episode of Brody Even Talk Pinball. Nick Lane, how's it going? It's going. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I mean, we got a we got a, a vaccine on the horizon here, and there's light at the end of the tunnel. That's right. I'm excited about that. Yeah. Who, who can't be? Uh, what else is going on in your life? Oh, my God. <laughs> I don't know. I have to remind myself every day what day, what month it is, what's going on. We're kind of keeping my sanity, but um, I'm, I'm safe, I'm healthy, and uh, that's all I can ask for these days. And we both have cool new uh, chairs, so we're doing that's all right. right. You got a GT yeah. Racing, I got a, I got a Titan, a uh, Secret Lab Titan, so, you know. That's right. I'm a, you, I'm a pro gamer. It's, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> you're not a pro gamer. You, at least you got a chair that looks like you're driving a race car. That's right. That's right. Well, it's the same. <laughs> it should be the same as, as yours. Yeah, that's right. You got a little race car. Exactly. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's right. Uh, do you do any gaming in that chair, Kevin? Or just I have, yeah. Um, my PS5 is out in my living room, but uh, okay. I, I play some of my uh, my retro consoles and stuff out here. And yeah. it definitely, like, I, my game's way more improved when I sit in this chair. I mean, oh, it's, absolutely. It's... No doubt. <laughs> no doubt. Awesome. So why don't we get into it and, uh, and thank some of our sponsors here. And uh, why don't you lead the way? All right. Oh, I can't see the sponsor screen. But, oh, wait, wait. All right. Hold on. You hold should on. have memorized wait. by now, Nick. Yeah, I, uh, I I totally should. Let me, uh, hold on. Let me uncheck it. I should. Okay. Uh, Kevin, this is... Uh, well, the pressure's on. Well. Um, I'll start it out. Pin Stadium. The premier partner of Buffalo Pinball is here at pinstadium.com. You can uh, light up your pinball machines, make them look beautiful, control them with an app from your phone to uh, choose the brightness as bright or as dim as you want. You can change the colors on them. All sorts of different um, uh, features. You can add flashers, and uh, if you're a streamer, you can get lights that attach to the side of the machine. So, tons of different options, tons of customization you can do with the, your Pin Stadium lights. Check them out. Don't forget to use coupon code Buffalo to save yourself 10% on Pin Stadium lights. All right, Double Danger Pinball, ddpinball.com. Go to Double Danger Pinball for all your pinball merchandise swag needs. You can use the code Buffalo to take 15% off. The Mod Couple Pinball, the Mod Couple Pinball dot com. Uh, that's that's my personal choice for uh, modding out pinball machines. I, I, as I said a million times, I don't even care about mods for pinball machines, but I like theirs so much that I uh, I own some. There you go, check it out. Flipping out pinball. If you're in the market for a brand new pinball machine, look no further than Flipping Out Pinball. Uh, that's Zach Many. He'll take care of you. He sells basically every new pinball machine on the market. One stop shopping for that. Pinside.com. Pinside.com. I like to joke around that you go to Pinside.com to argue with other adults about uh, uh, the pinball hobby. But uh, honestly, it is a fantastic source for um, pinball discussions, learning about pinball news, going to the marketplace for buying and selling machines, rating machines, finding out you know the, the top 100, the top 200. Which we learned that, uh, sadly, Bad Girls is uh, way underrated. So go there and, and, and fix that. Let's get to Bad Girls number one. All right, that's Pinside.com. Jersey Jack Pinball, makers of the most beautiful pinball machines on the planet. Pinball.edu. Go to pinballraffle.org for your chance to win just about every month a pinball machine. You've got a 1 in 250 chance of winning. Of course, you can buy multiple tickets. The uh, $40 that you use to get into that raffle goes to uh, charity to support uh, kids with autism through playing pinball. Joe Said, very good work that he does. Community Beer Works, the... Uh, choice for Buffalo Pinball when we want to uh, drink beer. Kevin likes him. He doesn't even drink beer. That's right. That's, that's They're all. just nice guys. 
They are nice guys. Good guys, good people, good pinball, good beer. Tilt Cycle, TiltCycle.com, our friend Dan Burfield. What a great time. If you're looking for a Christmas gift, holiday gift, whatever excuse you need to go over and buy some pinball art, go to Dan Burfield at TiltCycle.com. He'll take care of you. Custom pinball art, upcycled pinball art. Comet Pinball, CometPinball.com for your LED lighting needs, for your pinball machine. I actually need to put an order in. I got some. I got Ooh. some work to do. What are you gonna get? Um. So for my Jungle Lord, that game is really dark, uh, especially on the lower play field. So he makes uh, LEDs that you can kind of screw in that are angled a little bit. Mm. So I'm gonna put them like underneath the slings on the like the lower GI, um, because we had a viewer send it to me what he did, and I was like, oh my god, that looks so much better because the game is super dark. So I need to. I just gotta stop being lazy. I gotta get an order in. Uh, PinballMix.com. Pinballmix.com is your choice. If you want custom music in your pinball machine, go to pinballmix.com. He will make a professionally mixed, remixed version for your pinball machine. I've done it on mine with uh, Collective Soul Metallica. Kevin's done it on a number of his, and it sounds as good as what Stern will do, if not better. Um, honestly, that's that's why I look for it, right? In a mod, like I I sort of hate modding machines because sometimes it just doesn't. It's not as good from the factory, and it stands out like something's just not right. But uh. He does such a fantastic job. He's also got a coupon code. And if I forget to mention coupon codes, just type in Buffalo and see what happens. Um, but you can take 10% off, and you also get a free Easter egg in your mix when you use that. So pinballmix.com. Last but not least, Titan Pinball, titanpinball.com uh, for your when you need to replace your, your rings uh, or a ring kit on your pinball machine. I actually just put... I just ordered a ring kit for uh, Bad Girls, and believe it or not, Kevin, they didn't have a pre-configured ring kit in their what? database for Bad Girls. So. Did you put it in there? Yes. Oh, I saw on Twitter that somebody bought it, so you you made a made a little money off of that. I probably bought it, and I made money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, you were probably it. Oh, so anytime a ring kit gets bought, he posts it gets posted on Twitter. Yeah. How does that work? It's just like okay. somebody bought the this ring kit for Bad Girls, and I I give it a I gave it a like because it was Bad Girls. That's right. So it's done by Nicholas L. He's the go. artist behind that configuration. So it's uh, all pink. Nice. Silicone rings for bad girls. <laughs> I mean, what else I asked you the want? chat. I was like, what color should we go with? Everybody said pink. I was like, that's the right answer. I knew what the right answer was. I wanted to see if you knew the right answer. <laughs> that is the right answer. Um, and I, also, I can't recommend enough their uh, pinball mat that they have, which is, uh, I've said this a million times, it seems expensive. I think it's like 80 bucks last I checked, but it is the most comfortable pinball mat you'll ever stand on. It like ruins people when they stand on it. Like they'll go and they'll look at it and they'll, they'll stand up and be like, "Oh shit, no, I gotta buy one." All right, I got a story about the Titan Mat. Can I can I share his Titan Mat story? I think so. so. We'll allow it. Joel from uh, just another pinball podcast. Uh, we we message on Discord a little bit, and uh, so everyone's it probably happens to you too. Like people are like, "Is that mat really that much better than the one I can just get on Amazon for thirty bucks?" And I feel like people don't believe us because they're a sponsor, but I'm like. Here's the thing. Get it. You're going to love it. You'll see exactly why, how amazing it is. And then you'll have to answer all those questions. Uh, and nobody will believe you. And, and he, so he went ahead. He got one. And he's like, you're right. This is amazing. Because <laughs> he, he streams. says so like, if you're, and he's on concrete like me. It's like, if you're on a concrete floor, it's you too. Like in your basement, streaming for like two hours at a time. It's like your, your legs start to hurt. Uh, the Titan Mat's amazing. So Yeah, I, um. I actually just bought a like thirty dollar mat from Amazon so I can stand up on like my, my kitchen counter to work from home, and it's okay, but it's not even close to the Titan pinball mat, right? So, yeah, I mean, I mean, look no further. That that that's worth it. And you know, you get one, you just move it around to every game. You don't need. Sometimes people get mats for every game. I mean, look, if you're a rich kid, and you want to do that and, and really flex on your uh, pinball mat, go ahead. But grab one and uh, move it to every game that you got. There you go. All right, can we get into it, Kev? Let's, let's do it. The main All event. Right, let, me, uh, let me try to do justice to to Mark and, and uh, give him a proper introduction. So wow. his voice is heard across the planet in Stern Pinball's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Mark Silk is the voice of Splinter, Bebop, Rocksteady, Baxter, Baxter Fly, and Casey Jones. Impressive. That's a lot. I, I'm, I'm editorializing as we go. All right. <laughs> you got to throw some footnotes in. That's right. In Star Wars Episode One, Mark Silk performed the voice of Ax Mo, I don't, I don't know who that is. We'll get into that with Mark. Uh, but then again, I don't. I, I, we won't I, talk about my. Yeah, I don't want to get people riled up yet. 
is Grandmaster Glitch in BBC Universal Kids BAFTA nominated Go Jetters. Voices over 50 characters in the new Danger Mouse. He stars in Thunderbirds Are Go as action hero Captain Rigby. Mark has voiced Scooby Doo and Shaggy for Cartoon Network UK, CITV, Toys and Games. Hear him in Lego mini movies in Fifi and the Flower Tots as Bumble and Slugsy, and many more characters in the Emmy nominated Strange Hill High. Mark performs with Peter Kay, Sterling Moss, and Murray Walker in Rory the Racing Car. That's definitely a UK. The Rory. There's no Rory the Racing Car in the US, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> and was the voice of Johnny Bravo for Cartoon Network UK, DBVO. Games include Sega's BAFTA nominated Two Point Hospital, BAFTA winning Black and White, Overlord, Chicken Run, and many, many more. Mark Silk is the host of Symphonic Star Wars at the Royal Albert Hall. He's a regular celebrity guest at Comic Cons and gaming events across the country. Tops Cards New York feature Mark in his own official collectible Star Wars trading card. Impressive. Oof. Each are hand signed and collected by Star Wars fans around the world. Mark is in demand as a speaker for universities, acting schools, and creative interview shows in the UK and America. Mark and his little dog, Honey, have regular invitations to Birmingham Children's Hospital, <laughs> spend time with patients, their families, and carers. Sometimes laughter can be the best medicine. He's also a patron for the Brain Tumor Charity. Uh, welcome, Mark Silk. Hey, how you doing? I'm well, I'm impressed with me now. <laughs> <laughs> I figured he's kind of good. I can't wait for him to come on. I go, oh, never mind. There you go, man. Well, thanks thanks for joining us. You're five hours ahead, and you're you're spending time on a Saturday with us. So Kevin and I are certainly grateful for that. It's a thrill, Nick. It's it's good to finally chat on on uh, in the vid, in the vision, and good to finally see you, Kevin. How you doing? How you doing? It's great to have you on the the show. Appreciate you making time, and uh, can't wait to hear more of you and, and your story here. Well, so, it's I'm just I'm just a pinball fan. I do what I do for a living, but I'm just a fan of pinball. So I'm looking forward to just chatting with you guys. That's right. I had uh, I, I was chatting with Mark uh, a week or two ago about something not related to coming on the podcast, and I, I really enjoyed that conversation with Mark. So I was like. We got to have this guy on, and I think that you've been on some other podcasts. So normally, here's the thing: I I, I don't really pay attention to what's going on in the podcast world for for better or for worse in pinball, because I like it's to totally for the better. <laughs> <laughs> no arguments, because I, I I like to do kind of an uh, authentic show, right? Where we have on a guest, whether somebody else has had him on or or, or or they haven't, and ask questions that we come up with. So if this is a duplicate for some people, um. That might be why, but I think we're going to have a really good time. And one of the ones I, I enjoyed the most was having David Thiel on it. And I really enjoy this uh, sound, audio, music, and a pinball machine. So this is going to be a really fun interview. Um, I want to start out, Mark. Let's, let's talk about you and pinball because I think everybody likes to hear a, a person's origin story of, of how did you get into pinball? How long ago did you get into pinball? Tell us about that journey. Oh, it was right ever since I was, I was a kid. My mom and dad bought me a Tommy Atomic. I fell in love with it. In fact, I found another one at Expo a couple of years ago. But I, I got into it with Tommy Atomic Pinball, and then we go to the seaside, and I play, I play uh, pinball there. I mean, I know it's, I know it's not a love game, but I loved Bugs Bunny's birthday ball. I didn't oh. know any better. <laughs> I, I know I didn't know any better, but I loved the art of it. But in, t in terms of pinball, the thing I always loved, it didn't matter what machine it was, was it's this showmanship. It's like going on a roller coaster. It's the mechanical side. It's what Nick said. It's the audio. It's the visual. It's it's like a roller coaster that you control. It's it's um it's this immersive event that you are part of. It's not like any other game that's out there. I love the big showpiece theatrical arc games. There was something magical about pinball that I just fell in love with. And obviously, when arcades all shut down because consoles took over. There was nowhere else really to play that I found. And then with the resurgence of pinball in arcades, that love was rekindled. And probably about three years now, I kind of how I got back into it. Nice. What, is, uh, what was the first game that you got for your collection? And then uh, tell us about your collection. That was Aerosmith. That was, it was, oh, there was a game that was in a, a shopping mall here. The heart of Based. And there was just an Aerosmith pinball machine in the middle of nowhere for good reason. And it didn't work at the time, but it was, it looked just stunning, this thing. 
there was so much going on with this game and you know with um i fell in love with the thing i i went to i, I found it again in a, in a somewhere near here i buying the thing and it shoots so well that game and it's aerosmith it's got a toy in it that that um the the uh toy box toy the, the multiple out of it's one of those amazing pinball moments that is the first time you see it your jaw drops to the floor because it's just kind of cool but it was there was aerosmith then um a good a guy who's a good friend now pinball phil hi pinball phil he's kind of he turned into my tech guy but he the all-seeing all-knowing guy to get a family guy with working in animation i wanted a animation based in that in there and again terrific call outs it's just packed full of call outs whether or not the game is your thing there is so much and so much variety in there that you could be playing it for months and every now and then you'd still hear something new so there was that and then um yeah attack from mars there was a barcade that I would go to regularly with Honey, my little dog, who is asleep on the studio sofa here under a blanket. So she's been... Uh, but we would go and play Attack from Mars, and it was... It was everything that just seemed right about pinball. It, it was... You didn't need a book of instructions to play it. You would walk up to the thing, and it just made sense. You press the button, and this world happens in front of you, and it was funny... It was a sensory uh, uh, overload. You know, when you grab that, when you destroy the UFO, it's exciting for the first time. It's that. So Attack from Mars arrived. So I always think, well, I was, uh, I made a note here, guessing you might ask me. So yeah, Aerosmith, Family Guy, Attack from Mars, Monster Bash LE from Chicago Gaming, which is beautiful what they've done to that game. The lighting in that still stands up great. The next one was Star Wars the home edition which I know a lot of people didn't like at the time but often you found out that they hadn't played it because it was just for the home I played it at Expo and that thing shoots so well and um Pinball Phil did an epic audio upgrade on that from just the regular sound system that you get with it to you know um IMAX great speakers coming out of your Star Wars home pin and that thing really rocks the the uh, the the sound design you mentioned sound design earlier kevin the sound design in that game is so well used those assets every time you, a pop bumper is whacked or hit the kick the crunch it the room explodes with audio so the star wars thing again it's really it's just easy you you have it with you, know, you know, stick the coffee on spend 10 minutes just playing pinball then there was beatles gold edition which is, it's, I love that game. It's so well put together. And what Jerry Thompson did with audio, we can talk about that later. But with what Jerry did with audio on that game was so inspired. His, his use of voices and effects, everything was so authentic. Same with Batman Premium, which was the next game. And again, Chris French's art on that thing. Even if you never played that game, Batman Premium is a stunning looker. Just to have that in the room, that's a conversation piece right there. Do you remember when you could have friends in the same building as you? Do you remember no, that? Wasn't that, that like? I have no idea. This is the close it gets. <laughs> you have to go around with cameras and start your own YouTube show just to, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a whole new channel on Twitch just to show people, uh, just to show them my coffee machine. Yeah, that'll be good. <laughs> but there was uh, Beatles Gold, Batman Premium, uh, Theatre of Magic, that Pimble Phil. Uh, got hold of which uh, he did a nice little restoration on that and that again is it's a great looking game and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles because it's a fun game and I'm in it so that seems a good reason to get a game you go you're in it you should have this thing but also it's uh, it's I've had a lot of fun with it I mean um, during lockdown there was a rental I did uh, I, I borrowed two games I borrowed Jurassic Park and Deadpool which I had a lot of fun with and um oh there was a flintstones too in there somewhere i bought a flintstones game oh nice it, it was w with pin sound oh. my friend romain uh, romain in uh in france he helped co uh, create that and uh i got a, I got, I got flintstones pinball with pin sound and a friend came over with her kids like just after i did it and i used to i um, i would be the voice of barney rubble for cartoon network over <laughs> here 
So for like for extras and things. So you'd hear me. So you'd hear me go, oh, "That's right, Fred. Come on, Betty, let's go." <laughs> Don't tell Mister Slate. Hey. <laughs> so I was doing all that stuff for for TV. So when her kids came over, we, um. I re-recorded a whole load of call-outs in this Flintstones game and threw them into pin sound. So they would play the game, and every now and then, the pinball machine would talk to them directly, and they thought this was the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> now, you don't get that with your regular computer game. And then um, at some point next year, assuming tariffs change and things happen in the right way, I have a Guns N' Roses CE after seeing Kev's stream. Oh, nice. So, yeah, so that, that's the plan. Awesome. Do I do I win? Is, <laughs> is that enough? You've gone yeah, all that's, in. That's that's remarkable. Uh, um, maybe I missed this, Mark. But what was when you got Aerosmith as your first game? What was that yeah. moment where you're like, it's totally normal to have a pinball machine in my home, or like I should have a pinball machine in my home, <laughs> right? Because that's not a that is not a it's normal not a thing. thing to do. Even though everybody listening to uh, this podcast, yeah. it's perfectly normal. But when you go into the outside world and you talk to people, or people discover you have a pinball machine. Yeah. They don't know what to say. So where was that? What, what clicked? Were you, uh, do you see another collector? And you're like, I can put this in my house. What, what happened? Yeah. Well, it, it's kind of like if you, if you went to a neighbor and they had a roller coaster in their back garden, you kind of go, that's not the norm. So it kind of felt a little like, like that. It just, you know, it just felt cool, really. It was just cool. I didn't really even think of it like that. It just seemed a natural thing to, to have. Because in the same way that, I think we're so used now to big screen TVs and epic sound systems. Um, I mean, I, I got neighbors that their their speakers in their in their movie room are probably bigger than your average pinball machine. But that's Bowers and Wilkins for you. This to have a pinball machine was just a stack of fun. And again, it it was it was unlike any other game playing experience because it makes you it makes you stand up. It's a sociable thing. You put your phone down and you focus on this real physical thing it was it was just, do you know what it was just cool cap that's it it was it was a uh, cool nick really cool well, very nice and i just want to um let our, our our viewers listeners know who are, are watching this live um we're gonna have a kind of a viewer listener q a with mark after we get through our questions so by all means stick around for that and save the questions for that i see some questions in chat um so that will be the time to, to kind of throw them in there and i'll we'll do our best to go through all of them um all right, that's that's a fantastic. Thanks for sharing the history. I always, it's always a fun question for me to ask somebody. You know, how did you get into it? What's, what? What are your games? It's, it's fun to talk shop. It's usually an interesting story. So thanks for sharing that. Um, let's talk about how did you get into voice acting? That's not. I've, I've never met another voice actor in my life. I don't think Kevin has. Kevin, did you? I don't know you if I have. On me? Uh, well, I mean, I know you, and you're in the Domino's game, so I think that counts. Right? <laughs> oh shit, that's right. <laughs> you could just interviewed me. I, I don't know. know why we've got Mark on. <laughs> we'll do that next time. <laughs> how did you? How did you get into voice acting, Nick? When did you first realize it was really cool? Wow, I just uh, I realized how desperate Domino's was to fill up that that pinball machine that uh, maybe a hundred people have played, and uh, <laughs> was it? I hope you got uh, a free pizza. Broke into the industry. We did actually. We made our own pizzas at the headquarters. It was a pretty yeah, amazing time. Right. That's right. Yep. Well, to answer your question, how I got into I worked in um, I worked in radio. So my my heroes growing up were always people behind the scenes. It was always the it was really the, the craftsman behind the scenes of movies and games and TV shows. So I was as a kid, I was, I was fascinated by special effects. People like um, Ben Burt, the sound designer. Uh, people like uh, Derek Meddings, who was the special effects guy for James Bond, but he also did stuff for Thunderbirds, the puppet show that was big in the UK over here. There were people like um, Jim Henson, uh, Don Messick, Doors, Bu uh, Doors Butler, Mel Blanc, um, just a stack of people that really might, some would be famous, but others really were behind the scenes, so you wouldn't really know them. But I started in radio, and um, uh, whenever possible, I would sneak into the production studio and watch them recording commercials which I found fascinating because you'd see those voice guys in there doing that thing. And you go, oh my God, that's what they look like. And then, you know, there was a, as a kid, there's a, a TV show over here called Blue Peter. And this one day, the guest was like this sort of you know, middle-aged guy in a sweater. And they said, uh, tell us what you do, Don. He went, well, I'm, I'm the voice of Scooby Dooby Doo. <laughs> like man it's really creeping me out scoop and i was kind of looked at this thing and oh my god that's the guy oh my god <laughs> and to me that was the coolest thing in the world because it, it was you know you're seeing how this magic trick is done 
as a kid, I, I, I loved magic. But the, what I loved even more was finding out how they did that. So the, the, the VHS tape that I hired out the most as a kid, that doesn't date me at all. The VHS tape that I watched the most as a kid was the making of Star Wars. And, you know, just to see those puppeteers and the model makers and the sculptors and the artists, all of that kind of rolled into what I like. So it's like with you know, with pinball, coincidentally, it's not just one thing you tend to like. It's everything. It's every element of that machine. You know, there are all these different components that go into making a real masterpiece of a game. And it's the same with, um, I think, anything creative. But I, I worked in radio. I became a producer. Um, I, I was a decent music producer and um, I was working with other people's voices. Then eventually I, I was writing stuff myself and I needed voices and there was no one else around. I kind of taught myself and um, I think I, I've always been pretty musical. I, I played the piano since I was seven. I'm rusty as hell, but I, I kind of knew I could do it, but I was kind of um, shy is probably the wrong word. It didn't have the confidence to begin with to let anyone else hear it. So, you know, it takes a while for somebody that's doing something creative to go, look at this. Isn't this great? Because they might go, no. And then you kind of, you, you know, it's, it's a very, people can take things very personally when you're creating something from the heart. That's, you know, whether it's music or art or whatever that might be. So um, I taught myself how to do it. I got over that. I ended up doing a radio sh show for a while. And then eventually I focused on doing something that I just truly adore. And creatively, this kind of path led me down to production, actually producing, you know, like kind of like Hollywood movie trailer kind of audio. And then character creation. And I, had to, I wanted to focus on one thing to really make a, instead of just doing bits of stuff that I was okay at, focus on one thing and become as good as I could possibly be at that. And the two things I was best at, at the time were audio production and I was getting decent at character performance. And you know, I thought there's probably audio producers, engineers that are better than me, frankly. You know, people that have probably read the instructions. Whereas with, with character creation, that's kind of that's up to your own imagination you know the world's as big as you want it to be and i focused on that and bit by bit i i created the first thing that you need you know in, in anything creative is to let other people know what you do you need a show really you need a portfolio so i kind of i honed the skills that i of creating character voices and i i put together like an audio movie trailer it sounded really good it sounded good and even if you'd never heard of me which you wouldn't have done, because why would you? It started off, you heard this little bit of Warner Brothers music. It sounded like, it sounded kind of like familiar. And then you just heard, Hi, I'm Mark Silk. I do cartoon voices. And then like a mallet to the skull for 20 seconds, you just like heard a whole load of stuff that kind of sounded familiar. So it was me like doing my version of my heroes, really. Like, you are despicable. This is the last time I work with someone with a speech impediment. And, and you know, and he went through all these different cartoon characters and, and then my own creations. And bit by bit, people got to hear what I do. And, and it was word of mouth, really, that got, kind of got me started. But that's like, that's the beginning of it. In fact, Kev, you've, you've set up a little pro. I can show you a thing just for 25 seconds that is like a, an updated version of what I did when I started out. So here's a video version of uh, what I created back when I very first uh, started out. See what you think of this. This this might help. Okay. So that's what I get up to. Um, and also, I'm kind of proud of that because I'm aware that on social media, a great deal of the time, you'll be scrolling through stuff and sound will be off. So as far as I know, that's the first voice show reel that doesn't feature a voice. We got oh, uh, a comment in chat here. Chris the Pintern says he bought Two Point Hospital because he worked on it. And I will say, oh, Mark, man, thanks, Chris. Mark told me that he did voice. He did voices for the, uh, the radio announcers in that game, right? And I'll show you. 
Let me, let me just show you. Where is it? Uh, oh, I put it in the other room. Okay. Yeah, here's the thing. When we, um, Wist, this is, they, Sega released this fantastic game called Two, Two Point Hospital. And there is still new stuff coming out for it. I mean, right now, downloadable content's a, a you know, pretty big talking point within pinball. But for games, it's been around for a long time. And done well, done right, it's a real asset for any game player. Well, Two Point, there's still updates coming out. And the game was finished, you know, like a good while ago. But just taking care of its uh, players, we keep doing regular stuff. And um, when it first came out, they said, we want to send you a copy. I said, yeah, thank you very much. They said, what format would you like it on? This is when it came out on console. And I was thinking, well, I could do PS or Xbox and Nintendo Switch. And I thought, well, hang on. Um, Pimble's pretty good on Nintendo Switch. So I thought, Nintendo Switch, please. Then I thought, right, I better buy Nintendo Switch. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, so, uh, so my entry into Pimble on Nintendo Switch was driven by me wanting a copy of the game I'm in from Sega just so I can play Pimble on it. It's a very convoluted story, but there's that, yeah. <laughs> That's great. And let me just add that my, I have a 13 year old son who, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a dad and he's 13. I, you know, it, there's only so much cool to go around when, when you're a dad of a 13 year old. Uh, but, I told him that you worked on Two Point Hospital, and I saw him light up. He's like, "All right." It was like, "All right." So I got some cool dad points out of the interview oh, today. Man. So. Well, okay. If you if you haven't played Two Point Hospital, or even if you have, there's when it's basically uh, a, a big, a big, epic sort of god game where you, you're creating this world, and you it's you're creating comedy, uh, this comedy hospital, and there's all kinds of comedy diseases. Hospitals are wacky, right, guys? Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's really cool. And there's com- you know, there's like there's people there with a syndrome called Mock Star, and they all look like Freddie Mercury, and it, there's, there's loads of good stuff. But when you're playing the game in the background, there is a radio station, and I'm the voice of these three radio DJs, these three presenters. And there's a guy called Ricky Hawthorne in the morning who's absolutely marvelous. Good morning, and good luck if you're getting your spleen removed this morning. So there's him, and he's an absolute joy. It doesn't matter how bad the day is, he's always full of cheer. So there's him. For some reason, he's Scottish, but it just works. And then there's a chap called Nigel Bickleworth, who is on follow. He, he follows Ricky Hawthorne, and frankly, he finds everything other than himself. Uh, all the others are nothing other than total scum. So there's him. And then following him, there is there is there is Harrison Wolf, the conspiracy theorist. So Area 51 is real. The aliens are here. They're watching you, Nick. I can see your curtains. You have nice curtains, Nick, <laughs> but beware. So there's there's a whole bunch of different people, and and it's just a it's a really great game. And the the some of the team behind that worked on a game that we worked on together. Oh, nearly twenty years ago, called uh, Black and White, and that is an epic game. This epic PC game, and um, that was by EA. And we worked on it for, I just the audio I did for that, we worked on that for months. And um, I was the voice of the consciences when you're playing this game. You know, you make these decisions, and depending on what happens, this world evolves. And so I was the voice of good, and master, you do this thing and help the villagers, everything will be fine. And then you'd hear, no, go throw a rock at them! Doesn't matter, they'll grow a new one! <laughs> you know, it was kind of like this. these two opposites. But some of the same team are behind that. In fact... I had a very nice hamper, Christmas hamper, arrive uh, a couple of days ago from the nice people at Sega. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> Mark, I got to say, I um, you know, I went through your your IMDb or Wikipedia page and, and you know saw all the work that you did. And Black Knight, I, I'm sorry, Black and White, I think resonated with me the most because I I remember playing the uh, Amiga and Populous when I was a kid. Wow. And I have a distinct memory of just waiting for black and white to come out. I was a sophomore in college, I left my dorm, came back and, and, and popped it in. So never did I think I'd be talking to the voice of the conscious, consciousness from uh, uh, a black and white. So very cool, very, very awesome. Uh, Thanks. In fact, if you go on YouTube and type in black and white outtakes, a couple of years ago, I shared these outtakes uh, of all kinds of stuff that was never heard back in the day. And so it's us in the studio playing. In fact, something that I need to release at some time, I, I, I've kind of kept it wanting to find the right moment for it. But I, I was the only person to film behind the scenes footage of one of those recording sessions. And the, the recording studio at EA 
over here in England was absolutely stunning. It was like a James Bond villain's lair. It, so it was in the middle of the countryside in Chertsey in uh, the in England. And um, you went into the country and you thought, well, there's nothing here, there's a lot of trees. And you went around this corner and there is this huge glass building with a track all across the front of it. And during the summer months, the entire front of the building went... The whole front of the building would open up. But we recorded in there, and the studio was just cool. I've recorded in some of the most magnificent recording studios in this country, at Abbey Road Studios. I worked with George Lucas on Star Wars at Abbey Road. There's um, in Soho, in the heart of London, um, there is Soho Square Studios, which is, which is kind of like the place to record. Uh, uh, but this, this recording studio, they had this epic, old-school, vintage, patch-based synthesizer that they were using for effects and things, full of patch cables. And, you know, even if they didn't turn it on, you know, it was a masterpiece that was in the corner of this room. That at one day, they did turn it on, and to, like, to, to get it working, they'd have to give it a kick. But it was just, it was a cool place to uh, to record. But we we worked on black and white for months, and the very final recording session of black and white, I actually stayed around the corner from there in a hotel for a week, and I was in there for a full working day, every day, for five days, recording like a phone book, of voice work for different characters. I ended up doing thirty characters on that on that game. Wow. Yeah. And, and this just goes to show how important voice work is in a game. I mean, that I have not played black and white for 20 years now. <laughs> and, yeah, and yet those voices, when you, you did it, I mean, they, they stay with you, right? When the voice is, is, is done right for a good way, I, I can hear those voices. And it just brought me right back. That's, that, that's very good. And also, I think we all heard bad voice work. I won't say what pinball, <laughs> pinball game in particular, because that's not what we're about in this show. We never do but, that. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's the kind of thing that good voice work will stay with you, and you don't want to focus on it in a negative way. So very, very impressive. I wanted to ask just, you sort just of just jump in. I just want to jump in. I mean, just yeah. look at Adam's family. When you hear Raul Juli Juliet scream "Showtime," that's one of the most epic callouts in pinball. You know, and, and it's like you said, these moments stay with you, and it's that kind of stuff that matters when you're creating you know, new shows. Sorry, back to you, Nick. Sorry, I jumped in. Well, no, I have some non sequiturs. Well, well, first of all, a lot of people I know, uh, I think more people actually listen to this podcast. So I would encourage them to, to hop on and also check out the video because I think it's really cool to see uh, the voice actor behind the voices, right? That, that's always really interesting, kind of see the, um, the person behind the magic. But also, Mark is, is a dead ringer as a stunt double for Mixer Tuna. So <laughs> maybe one day we can get them both in the same room. I would love to see Mark do a Mixer Tuna impression because I try. I dress up yeah. as him for Halloween sometimes. But Mixer Tuna? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he is He is our, uh, uh, he streams on Saturday nights here. And uh, should, should I be? Kevin, should I be should I be worried? Uh, <laughs> I think if we got you, Nick, and Tuna all in the same room with with some glasses on, there'd be, be mass confusion. Uh, do, I, do I take him off? Is that for now? Is that much? About, I'm gonna do that. Gonna, you look more like Tuna. Oh, Tuna's here. Uh oh, give me just one. Is second. he here? Is he's he in here. chat? He's yeah. in the, he's in chat with us. <laughs> I can I can get one better. So there was somebody that wanted my attention. I'm just br just bring her in. Here we go. There, there you go. go. This is this is Honey. honey oh yeah. Nick. Oh, there's this Honey. Is, this is Kevin. Honey. There you go. <laughs> Hi. There you go, honey. This is this is Honey the Sheagle. Good girl. Do you want to go back over there? That's for Chris. Chris, Good don't say we never came through for you. Girl. Good girl. There you go. <laughs> Under your blanket. Good girl. There you are. <laughs> how, how old is Honey? She is five and a half. Excellent. That's Hang on. She, she never asked your age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. Mark, have you, has uh, the pandemic? I mean, do you do you work out of your home for the most part, anyways? And is this not been uh, affecting you much, or what, what's that like? Do you go? I know you mentioned Welcome. the studio, black and white, but things are different <laughs> yeah, now yeah. In, in the year twenty twenty. Welcome to the apocalypse, Nick. Yeah, it's. Well, I tend to work this way, probably about eighty percent of, of the time, eighty five percent of the time, anyway, because you'll hear people talk about this whole new way of working since lockdown. And I actually had um, digital lines put into my mom and dad's loft back in 1996. So I was able to work remotely <laughs> from there. Um, so I, I tend to work this way remotely most of the time anyway. But, you know, it's, 
I am I'm, I'm really do miss going down and doing ca full cast sessions when you're with the rest of the cast for an animation show. There's, I'm so glad that... that well, there's a, there's a show called Go Jetters, which is on Universal Kids in the States and on uh, BBC over here in the UK. And it's just an epic show. It's about you know a bunch of explorers in search for adventure, and there's a disco unicorn, and I'm the I'm the crazy bad guy in that grandmaster glitch. Grandmaster glitch! I'll get you, no jetters. <laughs> you come on and eat the furniture. But we record that as a full cast, and you were saying, you know, how does it affect you, Nick? The 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 joy of of all being together in that room when we're recording that. You feed off each other and. It, do you know what you could? You, I do it. I do work remotely. We're recording animations right now. I, I'm doing six episodes of a new show on Monday. I nearly said what it was then. Whoops. So uh, we're doing uh, new recordings on Monday, and that is using this microphone in this studio, linking live to my favourite studio in London, and it will be a really fun, enjoyable recording session. And the show, once it's all cut together, will sound great. There is something though that you can't emulate you, you you can only get if you're all together when there's a bunch of friends all working together for the same end um when we're recording those shows as a cast you you hear that vibe in the room and you, you do feed off each other so um i do miss being able to do that <laughs> to be honest i miss just being able to go for a coffee so you know i'm i'm, I'm being good and staying here i mean are you staying where you are nick right now are you kind of I, i'm being super good like maybe beyond beyond good so I, I've been I've been hunkered down. I've missed out on, on a lot this year, but you know it, it's important to be safe. And I, I try to focus on the positive. And what I've always said is, yeah. is if this is going to happen, 2020 is a great year to happen because you've got just so many entertainment options. You can kind of weather the storm. Thank God that we've been building up our pinball collection. We have games to play. So even though I've got four <laughs> broken games that I can't fix, I've got more games. So I, God, God willing, I'm going to make it through this. You know, there's, I'm going to just check, hang on, hang on one second. I'm going to just change cameras here because that one just overheated because it's just that damn exciting. Now, you bring on, in the heat, dude. <laughs> do. Now, I hopefully this will not make a clicky sound. It might do, but I'm going to try it anyway. Here we go. Okay. Can oh, you you're good. Look at that. Yeah, is multiple, it, multiple cameras. The two camera kind of guy over here. Yeah, I see the stern, <laughs> the stern hat placed there strategically on your. Uh, oh, that was not table. intentional. Oh, no, product that. placement. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a company boy. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Okay. Well, um, uh, yeah. I mean, with um, with with the lockdown, something else you know that, that has happened, and I don't think it would have done if we weren't in this apocalypse, is the amount of the amount of, of communication and just chats that I have with friends over Zoom and other you know whatever's that. I might not have had it otherwise. You know, I'm, I'm having, you know, I'm just a guy that likes pinball. I do what I do. You know, you know this inside out. I know quite a bit. And also, I, I love the fact that I'm working with these guys now. Um, but the amount of friendships that have come out of this hobby is terrific. And there's people that you end up just chatting with that you would never normally bump into. And, um, and I don't think that would have happened in the same way if we weren't in this situation right now you know uh, i was i was j just chat i was chatting with raymond davidson yesterday now you know i i i he can he would probably beat me to just start in a game let alone playing a game and he's like he's the guy right now and just the fact that there's people it doesn't matter what level you're into uh, the, these these games it's just new friendships when i was at expo over three days chicago pinball expo um, last year, I think over three days, I probably played pinball for about an hour because the, the thing that mattered more was just hanging out with with friends. That was it. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I miss that. And we're going to talk about uh, later in our show, uh, Replay FX. But, you, you know, pinball is a niche and it's a niche community. And, you know, people start to feel like a pinball family in many ways. And these people that you meet and we're all united under our, our love and passion for pinball. And one of my favorite things about pinball is that uh, our, our, our country is a little divided right now in the U.S. With, with politics, which is unfortunate. But pinball is the great thing that can just bring everybody together. And I think that you need to have those things in life where you just can connect with people and leave all the baggage behind. So that's what I love. I've met so many people through pinball that I never would have met, but who also might be radically different than myself. And I think that's fantastic because I want to 
not just me, you know, people that I, I naturally click with and become best friends with, but people who, who are a little bit different, come from a different place, have a different perspective and sure. uh, just find that commonality of pinball. And I, and I greatly miss that. And I put a post up a couple months ago on Facebook and saying, you know, pinball to me, I, I've realized, and I, I think I've always known this, but it's a very social thing. You know, I've been playing my machines certainly here and there and trying to get some streams out, but it's not the same. And I just miss seeing people in the hobby and talking shop, talking pinball, getting to know them and just sharing my love for pinball with other people and finding other people yeah. who are passionate about it. That's that's that is incredibly important. Yeah, it, it is. That That's the stuff that actually matters. I was talking to a friend yesterday for about two hours. We're, we're just having a Zoom call, just having having coffees from you know a virtual coffee. And we got to know each other through a love of pinball, but we would just play music tracks to each other. Have you heard this thing? You know, and it was just it was just two hours of nonsense and sharing videos and going, have you heard about Zeppelin? And um, he actually kind of half knows Robert Plant. Uh, there's because Robert plants from the West Midlands, which is where I am right now. So you would, he's, um, you know, Robert plant from Led Zeppelin. You would kind of see him in a pub every now and then. <laughs> so, um, it's this kind of Jeff Lynn from ELO too. He's from the area. He, Jeff Lynn from ELO. He's from about 15 minutes down the road again. Oh, but, wow. um, yeah, yeah. But it's, yeah. Now that, that would be an epic pinball machine <laughs> just in terms of it, it, they'd never make it cause it'd be too niche. Yeah. What's your dream to you? Have you got a, have you got a dream theme? Well, the, my dream theme has been broken. Uh, it would I probably would have said Le, I probably would have said Lebowski, but that's uh that's uh that's an open wound with the debacle that happened with Big Lebowski. So I maybe backup would be Curb Your Enthusiasm. I would love a Curb Your Enthusiasm <laughs> machine. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe uh, uh, I would love to see Jersey Jack also do uh, Indiana Jones. Not that there's you know there've been a couple Indiana Jones, but I think that's such an iconic theme, and that's like my favorite. Um, movies from the 80s as Indiana Jones. So I'd love to see Jersey Jack, get, get, get the Jersey Jack treatment for that theme. I saw some um, some artwork for Indiana Jones by a friend of mine. Um, there's a, I, th you know, just, that's something else that, that I adore about Pembo, just the artwork. I mean, you go right back to real, you know, uh, like say 50s and 60s machines. Um, and there's such snapshots of Americana of that point in time in terms of art and uh, design style. But you look at the art, the, the, we are in this golden age of pinball in terms of artistry. Now you look at Christopher Franchi, you look at Zombie Yeti, I mean, even the, the, the cabinet of monsters and the play field of monsters, an absolute work of art. Same with Batman. And then you look at what Jeremy's done, Zombie Yeti, you know, what he's done in Turtles is stunning. You look at the other stuff he's, he's done, it, it's absolutely epic. My friend Paul, um, Paul Shipper, he's a movie poster artist. He did the movie poster for uh, Ready Player One. And he does a lot of stuff for Lucasfilm and stacks of movie posters. And um, you were saying Indiana Jones. He's just, he's, well, he's done a whole bunch of Indiana Jones um, illustrations or movie poster style stuff for either new releases over here, re releases, and, uh, you know, magazines about Indiana Jones. But his, his work's absolutely incredible. But um, yeah, got to get him into pinball. That'd, that'd, that'd be, yeah. I'm just thinking about what I, uh, I'd love a Muppet Show pinball machine. Nice. <laughs> um. You know, a Muppet Show pinball machine would be absolutely epic. Now, whether it, whether it's too niche, I don't know. But you know what? If they if they if they did it right, this could be an absolute family winner because he, the the buying age of a pinball machine is kind of us. Uh, kids love Muppet. Oh, I don't know what a Muppets machine now. So yeah, here's well, I mean, my was, here's my idea for yeah. a Muppets machine. You got to have the old guys from the balcony on the top. Taunting yep. you as you play. Statler and Waldorf. Yeah, the, the, that's your topper. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be pretty epic. Yeah, yeah man. Or a Scooby-Doo machine. Yeah. I know a good voice oh. guy for that one. <laughs> if only we knew somebody that might be able to do that. If, like, <laughs> if only we knew someone, Scoob. Right, Scoob. <laughs> yeah. Pinball. <laughs> <laughs> and the, uh, Lego. How about, you see, did you see the Lego machine that, uh, that a guy did at Expo last year? No, I didn't see that. Did not, oh my no. God, it was in the the lobby there as you walked in. The heat, it was this huge thing. It was an actual working Lego pinball machine with toys and all kinds of stuff. It was a mechanical marvel. This thing actually worked because I I work for Lego. I do um, a stack of character voices for their mini movies that, you, that they show on YouTube. And there's I do stuff for uh, Lego Land in the UK here. Good girl. In the UK here, there's there's at their theme parks. I'm, I'm the voice of a whole bunch of attractions. That's kind of cool. 
you know, I'm a big you, theme park fan. So I would I would love to see you do the voice work for the uh, um, Deep Roots Old Testament pinball machine. <laughs> oh I, my! I see voice of God. I could see that. Yeah. What about food truck though? Shoot the left ramp. <laughs> My son. Or I'll burn your first child. <laughs> oh, golly. The Old Testament. It's a family-friendly one, kids. It's Come the on down. Day. They went with the dark theme. Oh, good grief. <laughs> not, the, not, the new, not the New Testament. No, so my. Just, just saying, Deep Root, he's here. You know, reach out to him. Can we find another one, please? <laughs> <laughs> what, about that food, what about that food truck thing? Just try that truck. one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I got the munchies. I got the munchies. Munchie multiball. That could be, you know, shaggy, right? That's that's his deal, right? <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. I'd just like, that'd be a great color. Munchie multiball. <laughs> that's the one. There you go. I'm in. All right. Well, tell, us, tell us about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. This is the, the first, but hopefully not last, pinball machine that you worked on. How did how did you land the gig? How did you get this? The, uh, they asked me. I mean, I, I kind of I got chatting to them at Expo. To uh, I, I was watching a uh, I was watching a keynote because I went there as a fan. I'm not kidding anyone. I went there as a fan to because I wanted to I wanted to hear how they make these machines. I'm fascinated by the mechanics of it, the artwork, the audio. Um, you know, you look at what uh, David's done. You look at what Jerry Thompson does. It's it's it fascinates me. And at the end of it, I, somebody name-checked a sound designer, and I went up to them and I said, I, I would love to work with you. I, I, I introduced myself, and um, I kind of said what I did. I said, I would absolutely love to work with you. I said, that was fascinating. I do this thing. and um, Interestingly, I, 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 one of the reasons I went over there in the first place I, I I was just getting back into pinball as a fan of the hobby, so I'm just fussing honey in the background here. Good girl, <laughs> yeah, good girl. Um, as I'm a fan of the hobby, and um, I heard Jeff Teolis mention this thing called Expo in Chicago, and I said to the guy that works with me here in my office, I said, uh, "Do you want to go to Chicago? You know, for for an essential business trip." Uh, and uh, he said yes. So I took us over there, and. Um, I, I, that was kind of what got me over to Expo, thanks to Jeff, also watching Tug, Tucky videos. But, uh, and I went over to say hi to Jeff, and somehow he knew me, he knew of me, which I don't expect, because, you know, I just do what I do, and, you know, so anyway, um, I went over to, to Expo for, for just as a fan to, to watch that, and then, um, we kind of got chatting, and it seems I think people found out what I did, which is which is really nice. So the next time I went to Expo last year, a whole bunch of people were like shouting out and saying hi, which is kind of nice. It kind of you know, it's 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 nice to know that there's people that like what you do. And um, I went to I, I went to Stern, and you know was taking a look around Stern, and then out of the blue, this thing happened again where. There's someone that I've never met, although I'm aware of, of them, shouted my name. And I heard, I heard, Mark Silk. And I turned around, and this, this Yeti-sized man with a very well-kept beard was standing in front of me. Uh, and I, I said, I said, yes. Uh, and I said, hello. And he went, I said, Mark Silk. He said, zombie Yeti. I said, I said, Jeremy! And I love his work. And he's such a cool guy. And it was just a, a treat to meet him. And I spoke to him, and, and um, over at Expo, we, I spent time with uh, with Dwight Sullivan and and a whole bunch of them. And again, just as just through sheer interest in what they do, you know, yeah, I do what I do, and I love to share what I do. But it was a real thrill to just hear them talk about what they do as well, and just hang out and make a whole bu you know, bunch of new friends. But basically, they asked once they knew. Um, I was interested and they liked what I did. They invited me to be part of this. And so um, there was then the, the casting process. So the way this the way this worked is it was exciting. I mean, I work on a lot of projects that are, you know, there are non-disclosure agreements. You can't tell people what you're part of. So, you know, it was exciting to be working on a project that, that you're a fan of. It was the same when I worked on Star Wars, you know, to work, you know, to know, to know that you're part of this thing that you as a fan would queue up to play or you know and that's how i felt about turtles so to know that i was going to be part of it was a thrill and and they took me through what they were doing with it and the characters they would need for this and 
um, I kind of said, well, look, here's what I would do with those characters. They sent me how the, they, it was, it's obviously based on the first season of Turtles. So the idea is to, um, you know, we are, we are recreating those characters. But, you know, not all of that cast are even still alive. And, and Turtles over time, um, did you watch Turtles, uh, Kevin, on that, when it was originally out? I did. Yeah. I did too, yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Well, as the seasons progressed, the cast changed. Every, you know, kind of, there were, there were so many different versions of Turtles where the cast have changed. I mean, even in one of the series, the one, the one voice performer ended up performing a different character. You know, the, so the, they changed c kind of quite a bit. So the important thing from what we were doing was to create something that sounded authentic that you believed it's you know it's those characters that you're hearing you've got to be true to, to those characters and the main one that i was part of with um uh, uh i'm splinter bebop rocksteady so splinter shoot the left ramp shoot the right ramp no nick the right ramp uh you know so i'm splinter bebop and rocksteady i'll get you titles of that there's there's baxter and baxter fly you know, or master shredder you know all this stuff and uh, casey jones and um they said we i got a load of clips i watched every episode of that first series of that first teenage mutant ninja turtle series i watched everything and you get into the beats of the rhythms and because often you think it you think a thing sounds like like you think it does and then you watch your back and go, no, it's oh, it's very different to how I thought it was. So I I um I did a whole bunch of uh, auditions basically, which were all signed. Would they were we, you know we went through a bunch of them. They were eventually all signed off by Nickelodeon, and then I ended up being the voice of these uh, six characters. I think it's I, I I know this is just me and the way I think, but I think it's remarkable and and, and really cool. And I'm a fan of uh, of efficiency, but that they soon got to hire one voice actor to do six parts that's remarkable i, lo I love the efficiency it's yeah, uh, i like that too awesome. <laughs> that, that's pretty awesome mark i'm a huge fan of my work <laughs> i remember hearing something similar about um the simpsons pinball party right they hired the voice actors that could do multiple characters uh yeah. so they could get like the most mileage out of the the actors they were hiring is that is that something that commonly happens in the industry that you're familiar with well it, well, it can do. I mean, in, in the end, there's economics involved in this too. But in, the only thing that actually matters is who's right for that role. You know, it might be that you do need six different people. It might be that actually if one person can perform six different characters and they sound completely different, you know, hopefully there's really good separation with what I've, I've created for the sound side of Turtles, for, the, for, for my characters in Turtles. So when, when you're hearing, uh, you know, choose your title, Leonardo, Donatello, Barry Manilow, you, know, you have chosen, you know, you know, good, good choice, my son, you know, uh, shoot the right, right, you know, it, it's all that stuff. So that's kind of how he sounds. And we, I, so he was originally a little bit more kind of, um, um, uh, slightly oriental sounding, um, so Eastern Asian sounding. And we kind of brought it back to just sounding overall a sense of being mystical. So it still sounded authentic, but it's still got its own unique stamp on that you know, particular performance. And, um, and so that's the sound and that's the kind of attitude behind how we are you know, bringing um, Splendor to life. And then with Bebop and Rocksteady, it's kind of, you know, you're chewing the furniture and Bebop and Rocksteady. You know, that's, that's, you know, it's turtle bashing time. You know, it's all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, and it's same kind of principle for each of them. All, all we try to do is make it sound as authentic as possible. Is the, um, is the, is the process of working on the voiceovers for Pinball Machine any different than working on a, another project like a cartoon or a movie voice or a commercial or anything like that? Only, only in the way that it is, you're you're recording. It's much. It's it's a game. It's the same kind of t uh, process as recording a game. So you've got you know, w say with black and white or with uh, two point hospital with any of with with a game. You're recording lots of short lines, and ideally you want to have as many versions of those lines as possible, so that as a player of the game you're not just hearing the same thing again, again, again. So we've recorded, you know, multiple versions of kind of most things really. And, uh, but, yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's very similar to recording any, it, it's in the end, it's a game. So it's the same process as recording any game. And with, with an animation, excuse me, 
with an animation, uh, you you tend to record you know scenes. So you can record. Uh, my pop needs to go for a little uh, ladies moment. Mike, <laughs> can you just give me? Can you give me ninety seconds? All right, Nick and I will live uh, we'll, on a live we'll side, feed. We'll sidebar. Yeah, sidebar with me and Nick. Sidebar. <laughs> well, I just take honey just for a little ladies moment. I mean, <laughs> well, absolutely. You got to take care of your dogs. What? Well, right, you got. You got to go. Yeah. You got to go. I want you sitting there. And go. I'll be right back. <laughs> All right, Kevin, you got some good jokes? Um, no, I don't have any good jokes. Uh, let's see, what's what's going on in chat? Um, uh, I had to ban somebody. That was pretty good. Oh, you did? You'll yeah. have to tell me about that some, later. Some, I, I missed it. Dropping words, and, uh, you know, the, the auto mod picked it up, so that's good. Oh, that's good. Um, so, Chris got to see Mark. Yeah, we got a couple questions for uh, for Mark in chat here. Um, yeah, we'll, no. we'll we'll try to save those. Save, by the way, guys, save those chat. Save those. We're, we're getting close to the viewer Q&A, so make sure. Mentally save those because I might not be able to scroll back or remember them, and we'll ask that to Mark. Um, why don't you talk about your game room update, Kev? Okay. Let's, let's um, knock that out. Well, the the most visible thing is behind me. I <laughs> rearranged some games, so I decided um, that I finally needed to put all four of my JJP games together. Um, so I put Guns N' Roses next to me now. I get to spend quality time with GNR every day, and then I moved my Neo Geo back there. So it's kind of cool. I like having uh, all three of the uh, the the video games kind of right next to each other like that. It's uh, pretty neat and then uh i didn't have to so i just like shoved everything else down over here and uh heist moved down and then everything else stayed the same so that was the that go. was the big the big change there you go all right okay. i mean they're not in chronological order no they are not you know what mm, all right Kevin and nick have been so good i think they've earned one of your treats too <laughs> share. let's put my ear holes back in i'm so sorry about that kids that's okay. Well, let's, right, there no you go. worries. That's the joy of doing it live, you know. <laughs> yeah. None of this is going to get cut out. We're just going to go with it. I would leave all that in. Oh, oh, yeah. I, I gotta, I gotta watch the stream bad guy to find out what you said. <laughs> now, so these are these are her favorite treats, but they're not any treats. Uh, they toothbrush. are toothbrush treats. Mm -hmm. Look at that. You ready, yep. honey? You ready? Good girl. Good girl. And we're back. We're we're back. <laughs> So how'd it go with turtles? Well, my honey, my uh, my little dog needs a pee. <laughs> they, Mark, did you get to um? Did you get to influence the the script? Did you write any of the the voice lines or uh, ad lib? Uh, what's that like? The real it's kind of my role. No, well, the answer is no. <laughs> but the really with with Splinter taking you through the game, there were very specific things that had to be said to get you there. And you didn't need to change anything they've, they've done. You know, kind of shoot to the left ramp kind of does what it says in the tin, really. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a whole stack of stuff that we did do. In fact, there is a, there is, do you want another secret flipper code? Well, I, that was actually a question, so I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, we would love to know the uh, secret flipper code. And I'm glad okay. you're on, so I'm not having to try to explain it to people. This is, this is all you. This is good. Now, let's see here. Let me just see. I, I'm looking at the chat, too. Uh, uh, wish the turtles the first came out like in a candy page. Yeah, right. If you have the turtles game, which I hope you do, and if you don't, go and buy it so you can use this flipper code. You've, you've, do you have it, Kevin? I don't. It's there's so many games that I haven't played this year because you know, most of the times I like to get my hands on a game before I drop five or six grand on it, right? <laughs> Make a note, Pinball Santa. Okay, for <laughs> right. your Teenage Mutant and Ninja, Ninja Turtles pinball machine, there is a secret flipper code. Uh, the way this works, it's kind of cool. I could, I, I got very excited when I first saw it work. And thank you, Dwight, for making this happen. So, um, in attract mode, you press both flippers at the same time. You then use the left flipper as the selection button, the right flipper to enter. So the flipper code is 197. So you press the two together during a uh, tracked mode. Then you go one on the left one and then right to enter. You then do what you do nine taps of the left flipper, right to enter, and then seven taps of the left flipper, right to enter, then right one more time to confirm. So 197. Once you've done that, it will then bring you up a super secret video on your screen of the game showing me right here in the studio recording the turtles audio nice there you go i, I have um 
I have one last question that I had written down here. And then if you have time, Mark, we get some viewer Q&A. So yeah, I'd love, love to. Let us know if, if you're running up against anything. I know you're no, busy. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so you told me you did a mod on your Turtles pinball machine. So this is a yes. pro tip that you can give to, um, I think it's um, it applies to the pro model only, I believe, right? Yes, unless you want to destroy your Turtles pinball machine. Okay. <laughs> so What's your mod? I, okay, the mod is really simple. It's on the van. Now, when you look at the van, it's the van obviously on the pro version does not open up to, to dump the balls into the play field, whereas on the on the premium and the LE it does. I was just just like you know dusting down, cleaning the glass uh, on on the machine, standing right at the top by the by the back box, and I noticed the front of the van because normally you only see it you only see it side on normally. When you're around right at the top, you take a look at the front of the van. There's all this detail on it that you don't normally see because it's hidden away. And you've got the Turtles logo. You've got a spare wheel at the front of this thing. And I kind of thought, this looks really good. Why aren't we seeing this? I want to see this. Well, knowing that no balls come out of it on the pro version, I thought, well, hang on, can we just turn this around so the van faces us? And I asked Pimble Phil, can he do this thing for me? And he did. He took the van off. And the first thing that really blew me away was, again, just how good Jeremy Packer's art is. Because underneath that van is all this artwork that you wouldn't normally see and all these little hidden bits of treasure. Same with the plastics that are normally covered up. So we put the van back on. He did this little thing to make sure that it wouldn't you know, move. And he, basically, you've got the van facing you now. And it looks so good. It is terrific. You couldn't do it on the premium or the LE because, well, you wouldn't want to. You got the, the balls coming your way. But really, as a mod on the Pro, it, 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 I think it looks really terrific. You've, and it also allows that little space to breathe even more. So you can see all this extra stuff. You know, you can see the ball going around the back of it. But it looks really nice. And I kind of got, I, I kind of fanboyed a little bit. So I, I put a picture of that up on Pinside and, uh, um, I, I noticed that a few other people have done this now. So that's, nice. that's my, yeah. So I'm in the game, but I, I thought, you know what, just, just for me. And if anyone else likes that, it's something that it doesn't affect gameplay in any way. It's just a little detail you can, you can do to see more of the detail that you, that's hidden away there anyway. That's it's a nice literally thing. a pro tip. So, so yeah. <laughs> Kev, I'm going to step away for uh, a minute or two. Okay. Can you handle the listener q and I can, but do you I also need awesome. a, do you need, do you need a pup treat when you come back? <laughs> no, Listen, I wouldn't say no. <laughs> I got a question for Mark for myself. Sure. Uh, so you said that at the, it, when you were talking about like all the machines you had in your collection and things like that, um, that you had loaned a Deadpool and a Jurassic Park. Yeah, so, I, borrowed two, I borrowed those two during a lockdown, yeah. So between those two, which one gets your vote? Like, which one? Which one's number one in your eyes? Because that's like, well, they both like two of the best games Stern has done recently, in my mind. Yeah, I mean, they both shoot so well. I like games with, with humor in. And for me, that so it's, it's Deadpool. Okay. I love games with really great character and, and, and sound design. And I really love what Jerry, I love what I, I'm a fan of Jerry Thompson's sound design and audio work. And what he did in Deadpool was spectacular. I like Deadpool anyway. And the, the, the voice actor in that's terrific, but the choices in terms of music, you know, you kind of got like, got, you've almost got like game show music in there and elevator music in there it, it's funny it's the first time i think i remember ever laughing out loud playing a pinball machine yeah so i i, I really enjoy deadpool i love the uh the sound package and the, the music in particular is like all these genres of music that you <laughs> never ever get in one pinball machine like that they just did an amazing job of of bringing all these different you know there's hip-hop there's ska there's like it's crazy yeah and it all works. That's what's so clever with this. There are so many, there's a whole stack of um, machines that every now and then you kind of go, that might not seem a good fit within that theme. With this, you could throw anything at it and it just works. But the skill is understanding how to do it right. And Jerry totally gets that. I mean, the other thing as well, with, um, with what Jerry did for the Beatles, if you think of what a versatile sound designer Jerry Thompson is, if you think he's the same guy that did the sound package for, for Deadpool did Beatles. And again, where it, he he takes 
he took a, a really good idea, but he elevated it into a place that if you know the little details, you'll get just how good the sound package is. Because he, he, used, he used Cousin Brucey, Bruce Morrow, mm -hmm. as the call-out guy on, on Beatles. And of course, he was the guy that introduced the Beatles at, at Shea Stadium back in, you know, in that time period. So to go back and get that guy to be the voice, if you're a fan of the Beatles, that's treasure. You know, so it's it's all those things. If you're if you're a fan, if you're buying, if you're investing in something as big as a pinball machine, chances are you're a fan of that theme. You're a fan of that band, and so you're going to get all these all these references. So if the person behind it gets it, you know that that's 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 a bit special. Yeah. Uh, so I'm always curious. So um, like. I have a background in like graphic design and things like that. So like I pay attention to fonts and like kerning and weird stuff like that. So I'm always curious yeah. what, from an expert's point of view, somebody who's in the industry who does this for, for a living, um, are there particular, what's your, what would you say? Like, uh, you mentioned Adam's family earlier as like a, a game with amazing calls. Is there, is there a game that you're like the calls on this game are just like amazing? Well, you mentioned Adam's family, and um, something I would, just as a sidetrack, if there was, it probably wouldn't get made because of licensing, I don't know for sure, but I would love to see an Adam's family remake where they go back and, and go, knock on Chris Granner's door and see, does he have the original recording session of Raoul Julia doing those call-outs? Because we've only ever heard those call-outs in really crunchy, low bitrate quality, mm -hmm. but I would love to hear those epic, iconic call-outs that, that are only in that Adams Family machine in super high quality. You know, like the dust and all the, all the grime has been taken off them. You know, they're still great as they are, but to hear them in super duper quality would be truly epic. So that's something I'd love to hear. I'm trying to think that Turtles machine is pretty good. <laughs> besides that one, besides uh, that one. Oh, besides <laughs> that one. Um, let's have a think. You know something that I really, that I thought was, was was clever was on Aerosmith just the use of I mean they used the it was the same voice guys on Metallica but it was fairly sparing how the the call outs were used but they worked and I'd think of you uh, you gonna start scoring points now and all this you know all that kind of stuff and uh, elevate a multi-ball you know this kind of stuff and it was really harsh and he would mock you but it worked and it, it was kind of clever too because Instead of having, you know, I'd have loved to have heard Steven Tyler in the machine. I would have loved to, but they created this. The they created this character that didn't exist before the machine, and you loved it. You you know you look forward to these callouts. These are special moments. Um, I'm trying to think of. I really enjoyed. I mean, that's classic stuff. Like I mean, you know. Um, Attack from Mars is, is still kind of fun. It's so yeah. campy and B movie. What about you? Um, I, I like the uh, Stern Spider Man, the original sound package with J. Jonah Jameson. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Taunting you. Um, you know, I, I have an Addis Family. That's one of my all time favorite games. So, um, you know, that's that's another one that stands out. But, you know, I like having the antagonist kind of like taunting you along the way where he's like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, even down to, again, it's fairly straightforward, but it's done in a very elegant way with Theater of Magic. Mm. You know, you think, what year is that? Late, is it late 90s? L late 90s, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but again, that's one of the, uh, you're into the realm now of, of high quality audio recording. And, you know, when, 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 that, when you hear the, the female voice go, you have the magic. You know, I thing. do have the it's magic. So, That's right. You have the, I got the magic. <laughs> it's so over the top. But yeah. it's these two characters. It's the woman. Then there's the, the there's the showman, the, the, mm. the announcer guy, the, the guy who's leading the way. It's the it's really simple. Uh, I'm probably not really thought of in, in terms of, you know, headline iconic pinball call outs but i really like theater of magic i mean batman's a really obvious one too because mm. it's just great clips of the show mm -hmm. and again there's a, a, a really good example of jerry thompson's choices too what do you think what do you think of like you reusing original audio from a, a, a theme versus re-recording new like pinball specific call outs or using sound alikes I I think you do whatever is right for that moment. You know, like with Monsters, you got that guy who who is the the impersonator of Paul Lind, and he did a he did a good job on the voice side of it. Really, you know, mm -hmm. for for. But you look at um, but with with Batman, 
you didn't need you didn't need anyone to do sound alikes. You, they were lucky enough to get back, you know, to, to get Adam West on Burt Ward. Plus, mix that in with with those great clips from from the the original show. And something else that's really special about about Batman: all of the video elements were from the remastered um, the remastered film elements. So they went back and you know f for the uh, Blu-rays, they went back and restored everything from those original negatives and made them look gorgeous. So you know you don't, you don't need anyone to do anything else from that. I think with 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 anything, when there's when there's um, if somebody else like with what I'm doing, there'll be people that wanted the original character voices. Well, one of them was dead, so that would be tough. Uh, and also, people's voices change too. So um, so and also sometimes you there are, there are specifics that are nice to hear for that game. And I kind of, I, I'm able to sort of separate myself. I've, I've worked in games for a long time. And I'm able to separate myself now from being the guy that's the voice in them, or a voice in them, to I just want to play the game and enjoy the game. Uh, and um, I'm really pleased with how it works. And um, the the guys as well have performed Krang and, and uh, Shredder. That kind of sounds fun. Uh, the guy who's performing the, you know, the Turtles, that sounds really good. It's It's a good mix. I think it's a really nice mix, especially that flipper code. It's awesome. <laughs> That's great. All right, we got a couple questions in chat for you. Uh, well, can I just say one thing on the on the on the pinball callouts from other other voice actors? Yeah, I think yeah. the the one thing that is super important is to get good jackpot callouts. And like, yeah, I'm gonna go from from two examples. You've got Chloe in 24, which is terrible. <laughs> Jack Pop. Oh, Chloe. <laughs> like, and, and we'll just blame the, the who's ever, you know, directing that or, or, or directing the voice actor in that. I, I don't know what the hell happened. Versus, like, Stephen Lang in Avatar. Ampsu Jackpot. You know, like, that, like, <laughs> dude, he goes nuts on there. And the Jackpot callouts in Avatar are, are so good. H hang on, Nick. How, how did that go again, Nick? I'm not doing it again. Because <laughs> that All right. So. Uh, <laughs> Pretty good, Kev. Let's hear. Program. Let's hear the. Let's hear the professional do it. I'm not sure. What, what was the jack? What was the call out? Absolute jackpot. Have you ever played an Avatar? No. The uh, you got to play it just to hear Stephen Lang's voice work on it because he does a he does a good job. It's like maybe one of the best jackpot callouts in a game. I would say at least in, in Stern that I can think of. Just really, Nick Lane really jackpot. <laughs> it should be that really good stuff. Clip that and All put right. it in your uh, Metallica. <laughs> I didn't end that up asking great. any uh, uh, questions from the chat because I asked him questions for myself. So, uh, oh, selfish, Kevin. What, yeah, I know. Come on. It's, it's like it's our show or <laughs> How something. Dare you. How dare you? Actually, <laughs> I've, just, I've just found a, a question in the chat from Kylo Bassa. No, Kyle Wan Bassa? Kyle Bassa. He says, Mark, your, uh, yeah, yeah. He <laughs> says, your mic audio sounds great. Thank you. Uh, he says, or he or she says, is that a Neumann TLM 103 microphone? What's the rest of your audio signal chain? It is a Neumann, and I love it. It's a TLM 49. I used to have a TLM 103. They're terrific workhorse microphones. You can put those in front of a, a gentle female voice or a gentle male voice, or you can scream at the thing, this TLM 103. It's great. This is kind of like the, this is the size of your face. <laughs> yeah, this is like a, this is bigger than a TLM 103. It's a Neumann uh, TLM 49. It goes into uh, a Rupert Neve mic preamp that which is like it's it is this metal beauty it's even got a button on it by default nothing to do with me that actually says silk so if you want an extra smooth setting it actually says silk on this thing just as a sidetrack have you ever seen a documentary called sound city i have not it's really good it's uh it's by dave Grohl, oh. and it's uh it's a documentary about a studio in california called sound city where um, it's those albums were recorded. So it's things like uh, Tom Petty and F uh, Fleetwood Mac, and, uh, and it's it's that kind of generation of music from you know, the eighties. And uh, it was a dump. I mean, it was a real dump. And you see some of the reactions of the bands actually going in there and going, hey, "We're recording this dump hall." <laughs> But the thing that the thing that made people want to go there, it had this mixing desk in the studio that made everything just sound like gold. And it was a hand-built mixing desk by an English guy called Rupert Neve. And after watching this documentary, I thought, i got to get a Rupert Neve mic preamp. I, got, I, want, a, I want a new Rupert Neve something in the studio. So over here is this uh, little box. And basically, you plug the mic 
into that and it it basically gets the absolute best sweet spot out of your mic it then goes into a mic preamp if you just want if you just came for pinball oh, i'm so sorry <laughs> this is like studio like, geeky stuff this is for so all the podcasters mic, out there <laughs> mic preamp then into your audio interface i have an audio interface by uh, rme and they make big beautiful mixing desks uh, but it's called the Babyface Pro, and um, it, the guts in this audio uh, this audio interface are the same guts that you'd have in one of their epic studio mixing desks. So basically, when I link up from here live to a studio in you know anywhere, it kind of sounds as good as it would do if I was in that room. Another thing too that Nick's already got going on there. Do you see Nick's beautiful curtains? <laughs> Well, he's got some nice acoustics there because of his curtains are helping deaden the sound. Well, around me here, let me see. You can see all little bits of audio acoustic tiles and panels on the wall. And, well, actually, if I do this, hang on, can I do this without, without destroying the studio? Hang on, hang on. If I do this, you won't even see Honey having to lie down. <laughs> There's her back leg. There nice. you are, yeah. Yeah, there you are. So, um, but... The room is also a major part of, of making what you do sound good. I've also, above me here, I've got a lot of honeycomb-shaped um, audio panels on, on the ceiling, too. So you could have a, the best microphone in the world, but it could sound like junk if your room is really echoey. I've listened to podcasts. from. I remember when I first got back into pinball podcasts a couple of years ago, there was something I was listening to, and the content was interesting. But I couldn't listen to it because it just sounded so harsh and off-putting. But, you know, like with what you've got there, Nick, it's uh, with your helicopter ear set, with your headphones, you know, the fact you've got a mic there and it's by your mouth, that's a good start. You know, Kevin, what you've got sounds good. You know, you, and you actually, and also, here's the, the dirty secret that nobody wants to let you know. Initially, you don't have to spend a lot of money either. So, um... A friend of mine, I mean, it, it, if you do, it helps. <laughs> you know, it really, it really does help. I mean, yeah, this this wasn't cheap, but it's, it, oh, it's an absolute beauty. And uh, yeah, this will set you up for life. But when I travel, in fact, at Expo in Chicago, at Pinball Expo, I recorded a couple of national TV commercials in the hotel room. <laughs> I got a thing, like an email saying, can you do this thing for us? And, and uh, I take with me a tiny little microphone. It was, oh, what's it called? I think it was an iRig Pro. It, this is not an expensive microphone, but it's enough to get you there. It was about 120 pounds, and you plug it in your iPhone or your iPad. And what I did, it was a quick TV commercial, and I got the pillows in the hotel room. I built a pillow fort, so that it like, you know, like you know, U-shape. I put the microphone in the middle of them so the acoustics were good. And I kind of like, you know, ducked down and I was going, get ready for action and adventure, you know, and, and for this new TV commercial. And I sent it off and it was on TV the next day and they didn't know that it was recorded um, in a hotel room in Chicago uh, above a load of pinball machines with me on the floor talking into some pillows. <laughs> <laughs> Dreams do come true. It's the, it's the magic. It's Hollywood magic. You have the magic. <laughs> That's right. Do we ask the most important question so far? That, that was going to be the next question. Well, how do you, 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 you get into voice work, Nick? <laughs> let me ask. Uh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say who this is from. Yeah. Let the viewers guess. Oh, but okay. This viewer asks, what's your favorite pinball topper? <laughs> who is that from? Man? Do I know that person? I don't know. if you Our know, audience uh, will our, know. Our, 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 yeah. Our, our <laughs> mod okay. Gorin. He's uh, obsessed Kaiser, with Kaiser, Kaiser. I, I said the other day in our Discord, why doesn't he just get a room full of pinball toppers and just forget about the pinball machines? Because <laughs> that's all he pinball. gives a shit about. <laughs> you don't need a machine. You just get a lot of toppers. It's fine. That's right. My favorite pinball topper. The first the first machine I got with a pinball topper was Attack from Mars, the Chicago Gaming Ellie, which is a big stack of fun. So you know, that, And actually, that scared the hell out of little little honey here. So uh, every time that, that thing went, your shoelace is untied. And, and jumped up and down. The alien on the top of this machine jumps up and down. She went nuts. But let's think. What have I got? Um, the actually the, the the topper. It's the topper on top of Monster Bash was, was kind of nice. Um, and you know what? I 
I haven't played a game with it on it, and I know it kind of it took a long time to come out, but I've heard from a number of people that the Star Wars, the R2-D2 topper is kind of fun. What's your favorite topper? My favorite topper? Jesus. I mean, the Black Knight topper is kind of impressive. It yeah. is impressive. Really I have not seen it in person, but I, I would say that's impressive. The only yeah, other I've one seen I, it in person. I can... It looked pretty good. Well, the, the, the ship on uh, Pirates is really cool, the ship in the bottle. Okay. Another kind of cool mod that right. I would do. I'm not a huge topper guy. Kevin, what about you? You know which one I like a lot is the Whitewater one. With that, the little, oh, it's good. got yeah, the cascading yeah. waterfall effect on it. Oh, it's I did not... have a white water for a while as well. I forgot about that. That's yeah. a great game. Mm. That's a hell of a left ramp. Oh, yeah. And then how it taps the glass when it's coming back. It's ramp. so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. Um, let's see. Or, I, think I hope that answered your topper question. I hope you're over you the moon. I wonder Ta what oh, his yeah. favorite topper is. Uh, dude, dude. Well, don't, don't. <laughs> yeah, that's still thing in Pandora's box, Mark. <laughs> I can. Don't do that. All right. Any other uh, questions from chat? This is where your guys' time to shine. This is this is the segment you've it's asked your on. time to shine. Now on Bro, do you even talk? All right, pinball? so Chris the Pin Turn asks, do you have a favorite pinball event slash show? Are you interested in competitive play? I would be interested in competitive play if I was good enough to be in competitive play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm not really into competitive play. I just I just like playing pinball. I, I'm not that guy. I, I really enjoy stepping up and, and exploring and enjoying the game you know I, it's a roller coaster for me i don't i'm not looking to do an endurance test of 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 that i i just i'm in it for the fun of the game um i, I yeah so in term in terms of pinball event i haven't been to that many i've been to expo twice and i i enjoyed it massively so you know when we can be back in the room again with with real people or even pinball players, <laughs> then that would be that would be epic. I'd love to be back there. I mean, I wanted to go over to um, I wanted to go to, to TPF. I wanted to be over in uh, in Texas in April. I was booked to go to New York in April, and then I was going to fly from there to Texas to experience that for the first time. But you know, apocalypse, so that didn't happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think probably j just because it's the only one I've been to would be Chicago Expo. All right. We had, uh, yeah. we had one more question from, uh, from Chris earlier in the, in the day when we were chatting hey, about other things. He says, uh, is, do you find sourcing games where you live hard? Is it hard to find games in central England? No, no not at all. It, it's, we're very lucky here. There's a, there is a good distributor here. Um, yeah, th there's probably two, maybe three main places that you can get them from, but there's kind of one main guy um, that y he's very good at, at getting stuff. I mean, also, even though the secondhand market's pretty good too, uh, and, you know, like with any like with any hobby, people that are diehard nuts about the hobby, you, on the forums, there's always, you know, you know the people that are always turning their machines around, or there'll be people that know. Yeah, my, my friend Phil is like the go-to guy of going, this is up for sale. Would you like to have a look? Would you like to play? You know, it's 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 pretty straightforward, and um, it's, an, it's a nice bunch of people too. For sure. Generally. Well, the overall, uh, well, <laughs> like anything. Um, is yeah. there, Are there any, uh, Pinball Nerds wants to know, is there any, are there many pinball shows in Europe worth checking out? The, oh, God, there's one in, oh, is it Germany? Where's the place where there's a real, there's an epic pinball museum? I remember seeing pictures of this thing, and it had, like, the, the pinball machines lined up around yeah. in a curved yeah. kind of manner. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of, do you know what, just because I know that I can't, go there for a while i didn't even bother investigating it too much but i know there's, there's a, an incredible place in europe um this place in this it's not a big event but there are there are a, there are a couple there's, there was one in manchester there's one in manchester and there's one in a place called daventry which is about an hour away from from where i am i'm i'm in um, birmingham which is if you put a pin in the middle of the country of the uk that's uh, we're in they call it the heart of england so in the west midlands so I'm there. So it's about an hour away from where I am, and it's you know it's it's in a big room in a ho in in a hotel, but really in terms of in terms of spectacle, the you know it, it's it'll be it'll be I really hope that the apocalypse ends soon. He said, and a really you know, obvious thing of the day, but you know what, I met so many really nice people at Expo, and the the idea that this year if Expo happens, it's going to be in this big new 
place so that it'll be you know it'll be safe the potential for more going on there is great i just i just want uh i'd love all that to just get back to normal again i know but i feel you know like what? we have this we have each other <laughs> you know we got twitch we can get online and chat uh you know yeah, if you got machines at home it's a good time to put some games on those at least but you know there's nothing quite like getting together and playing and i feel like when it happens it's gonna be huge like because there's gonna be all this pent-up demand from like let's just go <laughs> like i not well and we're, we're gonna and need are, a lot of alcohol gel <laughs> nick and i are gonna get into the replay fx thing later which is a huge bummer but um oh my god yeah i mean I, by the way i gotta ask this because um this again this is something that i'm aware that the, there are friends that are kind of discovering pinball um they don't have the space or even like the finance to, to do it to do it normal in normal ways but i got friends that are really into it on nintendo switch mm -hmm. and they're kind of building little cardboard boxes to make it a little bit more real where do you stand on v-pins i so i used to own one um it, right. early in the hobby when so this is actually an addition to my house that we built that's behind my garage you know we it's like, all right, that's going to be the pinball the room. dream, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. Um, but before that, I had a terrible garage, and it was not very big, and it filled up really quick. So I was right. like, well, here's a way that I can play a whole bunch of games uh, and learn them, the rule sets and things like that. It's not like playing real pinball, but you get sure. a pinball-ish experience out of it. And when, yeah, it's, yeah. when it's in a cabinet, it's, it feels more authentic. Um, so yeah. I, I like them. And actually, Nick and I have a very similar story in that getting into pinball – came through playing things like the pinball arcade and pinball Same FX here. where yep. it's like, Oh, that's cool. And it, it kind of leads you through the fact that it's, Oh, it's not just flipping the flippers and trying not to die. It's there's objectives and it's video game ish. And you're trying to get to the wizard mode to, to beat that big, big final boss. Like you would. In oh, a video Nick, game. Nick mentioned the, the early computer is to drip a pinball fantasies on the Amiga. I, I a, never played it back in the day. I've seen it game. like, you know, I, I, I've heard people talk about. It. I've checked out YouTube videos, and uh, you know the, the Amiga was way ahead of its time and really cool. So yeah. I have a port uh, of that on my Atari Jaguar right behind me. I can play it at any point, right there. <laughs> it just, just the the standard of what's coming out now that I've seen on the, on the Nintendo Switch. You know, look, I want just real pinball machines. So that's what I love. But again, to open up the hobby to people that can't do that or just want a different way of experiencing that. The, you look at the standard of what they're doing with Pinball FX3 now, um, it, it's quite amazing. I mean, Attack from Mars now, looks, it looks so good. The, the, the physics and just every, every, every other element, it, it's as good as you're gonna get. All, the only reason that I asked was at CES this year, they announced Arcade 1UP doing virtual pinball mm -hmm. machines. Did you see the Attack from Mars cabinet? Yeah, I did. They're like in that three quarter size cabinet or whatever, yeah for like six hundred dollars mm -hmm. and the thing is and i it's one of those when i've got the real deal but it really looked kind of cool yeah and it's it's like well maybe i can't fit six more pinball machines in here but this would be kind of fun right and 10 games in it right and you've got force feedback you've got um it, it look it looked kind of fun <laughs> all is they've they've um they pushed it back i think till march next year now yeah, and I don't know when will I ever get to see them in the UK, if at all. But I would, I would put one of those in somewhere. I can't help, but this is like I, I can't help myself from from just interjecting about the kind of the virtual pinball. So there's, we're talking about virtual pinball. It's people have taken you know shells of a pinball machine and put a yeah. flat screen TV in there, and you know, and they're they're standing up, so you know the flipper buttons are where they are because it's a, maybe a real cabinet and all that. Yeah. What, what sort of intrigues me right now is that uh, people are there's there's virtual reality pinball, which I think is even better uh, because you can move your head around. You can really get down and look at the um, the game like Zachariah pinball uh, has a virtual reality kind of component to it. And that when, we, when we've done that and streamed that, I've been really impressed with it because I can just mm -hmm. l really move my head down, zoom in and, and see the artwork on some of these old games. And there's actually a VR, it's called VR Pinball Dash Virtual Reality Pinball Group on Facebook. And right. what these guys have done is they've taken a step further. They've made sort of a pinball camera or maybe just like where the buttons would be, right? So they can stand up and, and like hold where the buttons would be, put on their VR headset. So yeah, now they've got VR. that tactile um, element of it, but they're in VR. So they might be in an arcade, right? They're, they like the arcade yeah, yeah, setting yeah. and they can just move their head. That's, that's really cool especially if you have limitations on your setup. Maybe you can't afford a real pinball machine. Maybe uh, you just don't have a lot of space. So this is your way of accessing a lot of games. 
And it's also a great way to learn the, all the different rules on the pinball machines. It's a, it's mm. a, you know, there's, there's no replacing real pinball. Real pinball to me is sure. not looking at a screen. But it, it definitely has a place in the hobby. I was watching some um, videos on YouTube uh, earlier on this week with, with some V-pins. And just, the, have, you seen, have you seen the Flintstones recreation that's being done? I have not. It's no. astonishing. You kind of go, I, I, you know, it's, I'm sure it's not legit, but the, the work these people have done, this machine is absolutely jaw-dropping. And um, you kind of go, well, you see the potential for what can be done. And, you know, that on a 4K screen, I, I, again, you, you said about um, just in terms of accessibility to people, it also might be that people people don't have the space or even just availability of machines. There might be a classic game that you know, not many were made or just maintaining a machine for some people. They don't want to get into that. So it's it. I, I think what Arcade wound up doing with this is it, it really could open up a lot of new fans of pinball, bring a lot of new people into the hobby that normally wouldn't go anywhere near a pinball machine. Yeah, it's like planting that seed. Like, say you have one in your house and you have kids and the kids yeah. play it once in a while and they're like, oh, that's cool. But like when they're in their 20s and they're going out and hanging out and there's a pinball yeah, machine, sure. it's like, oh, I remember pinball. It's it's like making that connection like, oh, I, I know what this is. I'm going to give it a shot and it'll you know spark what? the interest later. I just remembered how I got to know my friend Pinball Phil. Hey, hey Phil. Hey, Pinball Phil. Phil's getting his quality uh, airtime today. <laughs> He really is, yeah. <laughs> well, because originally I thought about getting a virtual pinball machine. Before I actually bought an actual real thing, I thought, well, hang on, maybe a virtual one would be better because you get more games in it. And I played one, and this is like three years ago, that he built. And it was a really good build, but back then they weren't at the level they are now. You look at the standard, you know, in terms of graphics and physics and everything else, then they weren't where they are now. Um, and that's when I ended up... You know, getting the bug and going down that rabbit hole but um yeah 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 it, it, it's just the idea that it was the idea of a virtual pinball machine that got me into real pinball mm -hmm. and so it could be uh it it really you know we we hear about people wanting to bring more people into the hobby this this really could for sure well Mark, let me just say that um really grateful for your time today and I and, and we're happy to have you in the hobby I think this is, oh, thanks, this is great. I hope this is, you know, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is the first of many uh, pinball machines that you're going to do the voice work for. You're, you're immensely talented. So thank you so much for sharing some of the um, the magic that goes into creating uh, voiceovers for, for, for games and, and for thank pinball. You, well, no, th thanks for having me on. It's just great to hang out with you guys. I watched the show. So it's it's nice to get a chance to chat, but but thanks for the invite. It's been, uh, it, it's good to be part of this. Thank you. Looking forward to uh, hopefully meeting you uh, in person in the future at, at, a, at a pinball show, for sure. I, I, will, I will stand by your shoulder and tell you to shoot the left ramp. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Sounds good. All right. Take care. Thanks, Mark. Thanks a lot. You too. Bye. All right. Kev, let's, uh, let's do some news and updates. I, I, here we got, speaking of, of voice work, Tim Kitzrow. Oh, yeah. Has, has I got to play him. I got him right here. Here's the Tim. Pinball news. So hot. It's on fire! All right. It's on fire. Uh, so I, I didn't get any pictures together because I was feeling lazy. So we're just going to talk fine. about things. Uh, the first thing up is uh, Stern tease that Led Zeppelin's going to be their next game. And to which Nick Lane says, I'm interested in buying a brand new pinball machine. After last month, talking about how he's not buying new pinball machines anymore. So lay it on the line, Nick. What's going on here? So about Led Zeppelin and me buying pinball machines. Both. Yeah, well, all right, well I guess, all right, whatever. I'll just... <laughs> Try to tackle it all in one foul swoop. Um, yeah, I, I uh, it's not like I'm a Led Zeppelin fan per se, but I, I really do like music pin games. And for whatever reason, I think out of all the artists that are currently out on pinball machines, Led Zeppelin would be towards the top. You know, Rolling Stones might be up there too. Unfortunately, that game was meh, mm -hmm. so I don't want to own it. But yeah, I even mentioned it to Martha, and she's not like a Zeppelin fan in particular, but she's like, oh, really? So uh yeah it intrigues me it it, it it certainly intrigues me and you know the i went on a whole rant if you will or or i prefer a discussion or um um a critique of the current the commentary if you will of the current situation with with buying games and, and chipping and pooling and i said look I'm, I'm not buying right now i'm not buying new pinball machines uh and 
I, I feel like some people interpreted that as I will never again buy new in box pinball machines, which is not even remotely what I said. Um, I just said until kind of these play field issues are resolved, I'm not buying it. And that's true. I would not buy a Led Zeppelin, no matter how good the game is, if there's chipping issues with it or if there's pooling issues. There's no way in hell I'm buying a, a, a damaged game. So what I, I said, I, I said I would be interested in a new in box Zeppelin, obviously, if those issues are resolved and the game's obviously really good. Um, yeah. And, and, and again, I'm going to go back to what I said at the end of last uh, uh, or the October episode is that when buying a game, follow, follow the following strategy. Don't play the first one to buy a new game. Let it, let it be out for a few months. Don't be the beta tester. You know, see if there's any issues with the game. Go on forums and, and look into it. Make sure that there's no, no chipping or, or, or a QA, uh, a quality control issues, right? Uh, ask your distributor, what happens if uh, there's an issue with my game, right? When, what's the remedy to it? How, how will you help me with this? So I will do all those things and I typically wait to buy a new game. So again, those conditions have to be met. Nothing's changed in that context. Um, now, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I, we haven't seen any of the gameplay or anything of Led Zeppelin. It's just been announced that that's their, a title that's going to be coming out. I don't know how soon we'll see anything from that. Uh, I guess Kev, Steve Ritchie is supposed to be the designer on it. Yeah, I've heard two things. It could either be a re-theme of an old game a la Beatles, or it's going to be a new Steve Ritchie game with uh, probably um, Tim Balls on code. So we don't know for sure yet. I'm sure I'm sure everybody in chat absolutely knows what it's going to be. But, yeah, we got to wait. It'll probably be next week, I would guess, based on their release um, schedule uh, in the past. They typically, like, will tease it on Friday, then announce it on Monday, and then you'll see, uh, you know, videos and the, and, and the IGN article and all that stuff. So it'll probably roll out next week if so, I have to So, do, again, I, I mean, if Chess trying to get me going, it's working. <laughs> As Serene X says, Nick will flip his position on Newham Box. All it takes is a title you want. It happens over and over again. It happens over and over to me. I mean, I, I don't know if you're projecting on my personality or, or, or my choices, but, no, I, again, I, out, I outline what it will take. I am, I'm tired of buying damaged games. I will never buy a game knowing that on the production line there's quality issues. Period. I'll wait till they get resolved. There you go. Uh, that, that's because what the smart thing to do in that context is you buy used. You mm -hmm. let somebody else be the, um, uh, the, the test dummy, and you go and buy the game for cheaper, and you ensure that there's no issues with it. Yeah, it gives now you a chance you to look it over. Now, if, if you know, a game's been on the line for six months, and you go into the, on pin side, this is plug for pin side, go on pin side, and there's always forum topics for a particular game, and you ask all the owners, is there any known issues on the line with, with pooling or chipping? And they say, nope, there's no issues. Then I'd buy the game. That, I mean, there's, there's probably a really good chance that there's no issues with it. And it's fine. So not flipping, not changing. It doesn't matter. I'm not spending that kind of money, though, on a broken game. I would never do that. If a game is on the line and there's issues, I will, I will wait. Games usually are made for on a two-year cycle. You have a lot of time, typically to get a game unless you're trying to get the you know limited edition collector's edition but i never buy those games anyways so i can wait there you go there you go uh, so i'll probably be saying this for the rest of my life yeah, because it's yeah. never really gonna be coming up <laughs> because people don't listen they hear what they want to hear uh -huh. and, and that's it so i get it i get it it's, there's you know, know I mean, there, there's a lot of nuance and discussion and you know people Not, pick out the you, little piece that they're like and yeah, people don't like into nuance. A, yeah, in, yeah. Into they, a they hear, Nick's right. never buying a new unboxing. Yeah. Oh, he's buying a new unboxing game. <laughs> yep. I, I got 20, 30 more, 40 more years of my life. Well, 20 years. I'm going to be buying pinball machines for many years to come. So. <laughs> there you go. So, what do you think? So, Led Zeppelin's a theme you like, obviously, if you would consider it. Um, what do you think about just like rock band themes in general? Do you think we're like getting played out? Do you think they're. We're getting to. There's a lot. Do you think there's a long runway ahead uh, with with the rock band rock band themes or? There's there's more. I mean, like I I feel like they could do U2. I would love a mm -hmm. U2. I'm not, again, I'm not like a huge U2 fan, but out of all the themes you can do, of like artists that have been around for decades and have a huge catalog of work and just you know world renowned, U2 would be a great band. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that that'd be that'd be fantastic. So yeah, there, there's there's more artists. And always, again, you hear people on and Facebook say, oh, another dad rock theme. Dude, it's Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you're not going to pick a modern-day artist that could be forgotten about in five or ten years, right? You, you want to pick an artist that's been around for, for decades or their catalog of work is just well-known and, and they've really established themselves. So, 
it, it's a, it's a, it's a business you want to, um, be able to market to the largest customer base possible. So I, I don't think it's played out. I think, I think games are a lot of fun. They're like jukeboxes that you can play. You know, I was never a Metallica fan, but I own a Metallica pinball machine and it helped me get into their music. Um, just because it's such a good integration between what pinball is and music is incredibly important in a pinball machine. So it's a nice natural fit. And obviously they're selling cause they keep making them. So it's a winning formula, right? Like it, yeah. They wouldn't keep making them if they, they weren't selling the same like with like uh, the Marvel themes and, and things like that and, and movie themes. Um, you know, look at Gun, Guns N' Roses sold out like in a couple hours. They're twelve twelve hundred dollars or twelve thousand dollar machines sold out like that, you know, and people hadn't played them because they're they had just gotten announced. But, it, you know, there's people resonate with a certain theme. And they're like, I remember that band looks amazing. Video looks good. Let's go. I'm buying it. I, I so claim that. I think it'd be incredibly smart for somebody to, to do like an EDM pinball machine uh, because you can probably license a ton of tracks. So there could be, I mean, it could be a hundred tracks in the machine where you're sort of doing this rock band S thing by completing the track. You know, you know, it starts off of a basic beat. You hit like the right ramp and that adds another layer into the music until finally you complete the song and you're like a DJ performing um, a set list or something like that, that can just be a ton of different combinations. Nick, you need to just, great... you need to learn programming real quick and then uh, make it for the P3. Listen, I'm an ideas play. guy. Yeah. You can, that's what you hire me for. <laughs> you know, I'm the architect ideas. That That's, that's the, I know my lane. You know, I know my Nick lane. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, thank you, Kev. <laughs> nicely done, nicely done. All, All right, right, so what do you, I mean, what do you think about Led Zeppelin? Are, is that, what does that do for you? Eh, if, it, if it's good, I, it's not like, it's not a band I would run out and buy. But if yeah. the game's amazing, then you know it. You know, I I've owned terrible themed games that were really good, like like Congo and things like that. So, um, you know, if it ends up being one of the best pinball machines of all time, now we're talking. If it ends up being a Quicksilver at twelve thousand dollars, then I'm out. Right. 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 Yeah, I don't like that. You know, I I think it'd be. Uh, I was saying in Discord the other day, if they do like a retheme of Quicksilver or whatever classic Stern just price it in a way where you're you're not putting on a ridiculous price for an old solid state game will they do that probably not but my argument would be um look you're competing against a lot of different ma pinball manufacturers now so you, you got to be competitive and you can steal away a lot of business from these other pinball manufacturers if you put it at a price point where it's hard to resist where you're still making money now i think it was attack that pointed out in discord well you know maybe there's the licensing for Led Zeppelin might be really expensive. I have I have no idea. This is just speculation. But yeah, if if you have a game that's like Led Zeppelin, and it's a retheme of a, a, a an early solid state, and it's four thousand forty five hundred. I know I'm dreaming. Mm -hmm. uh, then that becomes yeah, maybe I would do that. Maybe I would do that. If you're charging like Beatles prices or something stupid, no way in hell. So yep. there you go. There you go. Uh, uh, I see you next. Wants to know what my game of the year pick is. So it's hard because. I haven't played all the games that came out this year. You know, it's such a weird, uh, weird year. Like normally we play all the new games as they come out because your company would get them. We would go stream them. Um, so I can't really fairly pick out of all the games. I haven't played any of, I don't think I've played any of the, the Stern games that came out this year, but yeah. you know, I have a heist and I have a GNR and they're both amazing. So um, I, w I would highly recommend either one of those. So, yeah, I've yeah. played no new games, yeah. so I've got nothing. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. So it's gonna be a weird right. year, and that's you know, they're you're going ahead and having you know, like people pick their game of the year. It's like how many of these games have you people actually played? Or are you just picking it based on what? Uh, you yeah, think honestly, is the best? they should not do that this year. Yeah, I, I I don't know. It's weird not to do it, but come on, I, people aren't really playing any games. I know, I know. It's very limited, if if nothing else. But yeah, they probably you know everybody probably bought one game. You know who's voting, and that's the game they're going to vote for as game of the year. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So let's move on to some sad news. Um, the end of the Replay Foundation, which means the end of Replay FX, which means the end of Pinberg, which means the end of Papa. Man, this is like this is like, like this year sucked, right? But this news came out, and I was like, it really bummed me out. It freaking sucked. I don't know. Wait, you know it's. For us, we've always talked about it as pinball summer camp. It's a great way to get away. Um, the Pinberg experience spe specifically was, it's this huge, like, let's all go out and do this thing we love in the city that's super fun. I mean, we can go, you know, play games all day and then go out down their, their main strip 
and get good food at night and hang out and, you know, see people like Tuna and Skip and Rudy, who I never only see like once or twice a year. Um, yeah, so all that's gone. So um, it sucks. Yeah, I um, when the news came out, it sort of hasn't emotionally totally registered yet because this is just kind of the year of disappointment and things getting canceled that I'm, I'm sort of numb feeling wise. So I'm just waiting for it to kind of really hit me. It's kind of how I am. It, it, it takes a while. Um, I, uh, I've gone to all the Pinbergs in the, in the, there was like some, a couple of Pinbergs in the two thousands. Um, and they were kind of like a different iteration, but in the modern iteration since 2011, I've been to all of them. And you know, going back to the original Papa facility, which is just a, 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 a magical place. And I'm really, really sorry. And I, and this bums me out to think about this. I'm really sorry for all the people in the, who came later in the hobby and never got to go to the original Papa facility because that place is like Shangri-La. I, I will never forget the first time walking into the, just the original Papa facility for Pinburg in, uh, it was March or April, 2011. And just being in, in awe, like just having this experience of walking into this building and just like trying to register what I'm seeing, the, 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 the sights, the sounds, all these pinball machines under one roof. And I had just been in pinball for a few months at that point. And it, it's just, I, I can't, I cannot put into words how amazing it is. And I would get that experience every time I went to the pop-up facility, you mm -hmm. know, for, for Pinberg and, and Papa and, and all the people that I met and the, and the friends I made in, in the pinball community. And, you know, I met Dan Burfield in like the parking lot where he just like, didn't know who the hell I was. It's probably, probably 2011. He's like, Hey, you want a beer dude? And, and just super nice guy. And you know, now, now we're friends. He's a sponsor. It's just like, there's so many stories like that. So the Papa facility was absolutely magic, you know, and then replay FX. And, and, and Pinburg, when it moved to the convention center, was just sort of um, on, on, a, on a different, special on a different level. Uh, yeah, I, I never thought that that would go away because the fact that it was selling out like in less than a minute, just the demand for it. I just never thought in my mind that this thing would stop. So I think it's it's not registering with me totally that, that it is gone away. And uh, we're trying to get... Doug Polka to come on the stream. I know he's he's busy, and we want to talk to him about all that. And my God, I hope that uh, I I hope that there's some good news to come. I hope that something comes out bigger and better. You know, pinball shows are great and all, um, but they're going into like a hotel banquet room and just kind of playing games for a couple of days. And it's not the same. No, it's not even close to the magic of first of all the original Papa facility. I really hope that you know there's there's some very well to do people in this hobby and i think that's just what it's going to take to to have somebody who's really passionate and can kind of carry that torch right uh, uh, of of taking over for that and having a a destination like that or some just special place where machines are preserved and taken care of and uh you know uh, us kind of uh people who are passionate about pinball can get together i don't know man thank god we got shows but it's uh, it's 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 hard. It's it, it, uh, uh, it's going to be processing this for a long time. Yeah, I, I'm I'm eyeing up uh, in disc is probably the thing that I do in place of Pinberg whenever we're able to come back. Probably 2022, hopefully. Um, you know, fly that Banning Museum looks amazing. It's, it, I feel like it would have a similar feel when you go in there. Just a, like a cool place that's packed with pinball machines of all eras. And also an awesome tournament. So it's not going to be like a Pinburg style tournament. It would be more like a Papa tournament, which is different. It's not, I, it's, I don't enjoy it as much, but it's still really fun to play in those tournaments. Um, and to have something that high quality, you know, you know, Carl's going to do a good job and, and, and run a great tournament. So um, that, and probably the, uh, the VFW show of that ends up sticking around. I, I definitely want to do that. That was the yeah. thing we were all going to do that got canceled um because it was going to happen right after everything got shut down so yeah um, maybe one we'll of these years hit, we'll try to hit up um you know more maybe we go try you and i were going to do like one pinball show a year right, right. and try mm -hmm. to vary the mix them up maybe we'll do two or something like that and I, I think also the other thing that pinberg did was it's an excuse for us you know uh, us kind of 
good friends in, in Buffalo to hop in Rob's van or whatever and travel down and, and spend, you know, several days hanging out and shooting the shit. And, and, and that, that kind of stuff's important. You yep. know, it's hard to get it. We, you have families and stuff, you got your careers. Um, and, and that was a good excuse to do that. So I hope that, you know, we recognize that as a group and, and so many groups did that together. So many groups travel together, you know, having that excuse to, to get away that, that is super important. Uh, you know, just kind of, I've been reflecting on all the social aspect. So I, I just want to say one thing in chat. I, I, I Serena X, my God, my God, you and I are uh, coming to a head uh, in, in this. So I want to, I just want to call this out a little bit. He writes, he or she writes classic poorly run business, hard to keep afloat when business essentials are not followed. So let me just parse that out a little bit. You're, you're, you're in, in some ways you're not wrong, but this is, was something that was not a business. Okay. It was a, a foundation. It was a not-for-profit. So, um, they did a good job for a number of years of keeping the, keeping it going, right? Like, uh, as, as a nonprofit in the model, I will say in, in being charitable to what you're writing, this is, goes to my case. And we've talked about this before for our tournament. This has got to be run like an event planning going forward. It can, uh, there's this expectations of like running pinballs, charity and running pinball tournaments as charity and, and goodwill, but it needs to be run more like a business and you need to be profitable and you need to bank money to be sustainable. And listen, people in pinball have money and they will, they will pay for it. So if, if any lesson is learned um, from this and whoever kind of takes up the, uh, uh, the banner is make money off this in, in a way that's, that's sustainable and, and planning for the future. Now, they, the, the folks at Replay FX in Pinburg ran those events remarkably well. Like it is mind blowing what they were able to pull off. And it is a pain in the ass to, to be moving these machines around, to be fixing. There's like, I can't imagine anything more difficult. This is, is an extremely difficult thing to pull off. And you're going on people's kind of passion and goodwill. Yeah. And there's, God knows there's a lot of that. Um, so hopefully we can combine passion and goodwill with sort of the event planning or, um, you, you know, just kind of what this can bring in so we can sustain it. I don't know. So I, I feel like this is a little rambling, but um, I, 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 I just, I, I, I want events like this to continue. So well, let's make that happen somehow. Yeah. So it, even then it's like, yeah, there could end up being like two kinds of shows, like more expensive shows where you're doing stuff like this. And then also like the more, the more homebrew, like the smaller stuff where everybody can just bring a game and we can hang out and, 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 and stuff like that. So I think there's room for both, but if you want to do something on the scale of Pinburg, it is a massive undertaking. They worked year, like a full yeah. year to pull off an event like that with a huge staff. And so there's tons of expenses that come along with it. And like to Nick's point, there's this mindset in pinball where like all the money that goes into the tournament has to get paid out to the players. And, you know, it's like, you can't, you can't do that. What business do you go to and you're yeah. like, well, uh, 100% of this money has to go to uh, the person serving my uh, or the person serving my my meal gets all this money. No money goes to the yeah. to buy the food or to market or anything like that. Yeah, that mentality destroys the future of, of large scale tournaments and events. It, it absolutely will destroy it. It needs to change. And if somebody says that, my only question is why? Why, 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 why is pinball different or, or special? And this, I think we're seeing that, you know, from our experience, Kevin, you know, it's not like we do it for the money, but at some point you don't want to be sort of this indentured servant to pinball, right? right? You don't want to be taken advantage of because of your, your passion for it. And new um, events as Newman's own hundred percent of profits go to charity. And that's fine. There could still be events like that. I'm talking about running a Pinburg, you know, right. running massive events that take years of time. I event planning is a talent it's a skill and it's a lot of work okay and i've seen poorly run events you you wanna you want people who have event planning expertise to put on a good event and that's worth money it's worth compensating them for that talent in that time yeah so. and there's there's multiple levels of knowledge you're going to need to do a good pinball tournament right you're going to need to know pinball you're going to need to know like maintenance and setup and all that stuff you're going to need tournament experience which only comes with time and expertise and practice and playing in them. And then you're going to need to know just like general uh, event planning skills, like running a website, you know, 
coordinating with hotels to get room block deals, uh, marketing yeah. the event, uh, there, and you know managing the people to make it all happen. So there's multiple levels of skill sets that you're going to need to to pull off in a pinball event like this. Hundred percent. All right. All right. Uh, so yeah, I think that that, that kind of says it. Um, Nick, you want to talk about uh, Retro Atomic Zombie Adventureland? Well, there was some news, right? That they post pricing, and are they selling it now officially? I didn't yeah, you can that. pre-order. You can pre-order from the company that said there would be no pre-orders. You can pre-order. Jeez, how, and how much are they asking for uh, it? So the the like arcade edition is just under six grand. The oh, okay. extra edition is more like ten. Oh Jesus, and that's a big gulf of difference. Yeah, and then there's like all these different add-ons and things. Like the sounds the, complicated. The extra edition doesn't come with GI. It's an add-on. Hmm. Um, okay. yeah. Well, I mean, the only thing I'd say about Razo right now is just, uh, you know, they did a stream. There was a stream a month ago where um, I think this is the first time really it's been streamed, right? The debut yeah. stream. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I wouldn't say it's an official stream, but my understanding is that this is, is on maybe like a test location at a brewery or coffee place. And some streamers, I think they're in Texas, went down and you know, they were posting that they're going to show gameplay of it and stream it. So, of course, this is the first stream of Raza. Uh, everyone's going to be interested in checking it out. And I, and I tried to watch it. And, and this is, listen, this is, this is, this is who I am. All right. I'm, I'm not out to shit on another streamer or anything like that, but it wasn't a good stream. And this is more so on Deep Root than it is on the, on the streamers. I'm not picking on them. Um, the stream was very kind of confusing. You couldn't hear the game music well. There were people talking over people, uh, weird camera. It's just not a good representation of your first game from a brand new pinball company. So why the hell did Deep Root allow this in any way? I mean, yeah, maybe they want the game out on test location, but they should have said to this, this uh, company where the game is, hey, no one is allowed to stream it, no video, nothing. You want to keep that thing tightly under wraps because, again, this is just shows poor decision-making. And I don't – I don't. they need a marketer and a PR person yesterday uh, because the game was resetting. It was just a very bad representation of the game. I couldn't get through five minutes of it. And I will really? say, as you know, we've done reveal streams, and no matter what you do, you get criticized, right? Because um, you didn't show something in a certain way or, you know – people freaked out because my uh reveal stream of gnr like i had the volume of the game down at the start because i had Kiefer and uh and joe Katz on and we were talking and explaining the game and later in the game later in the stream i had a whole section where it was just gameplay no mic all audio of the game but people turn it on and they're like well it's not exactly what i want right now therefore i'm gonna run to pinside and bitch about it um so yeah, I will say it's it, it's tough. It's tough doing an, a, a, a first showing of a game like this. But to your point, you know, when we do like for Guns N' Roses, I plan weeks in advance for something like that and put a lot of yeah. thought into how I'm going to present it. So to for Deep Root to say, yeah, come out and throw a stream rig on this and we'll yeah. see how it goes for its first impression is not a good look for the game, no matter who's doing it, right? Yeah, and I'm going to be very clear again because people want to hear what they want to hear. This is not the streamer's fault. This is Deep Root's fault for allowing this to happen. I mean, honestly, at this point, Deep Root's best bet is to just not even do a live stream, is to showcase that game, do a, a pr promo video, or to do a pre-recorded video gameplay stream, walk through, have Steve Bowden talk. Somebody hire a fucking actor to read a script and, and, and go over, do voiceovers, explain the game. Okay, that's what they need now. They need a really good representation of the game, not to throw it out in the wild and have somebody just randomly kind of stream it. And the game was resetting. The game, the game has problems. So uh, not good. I think uh, somebody in chat said... Uh, uh, I. F the Geek says, I think it was a fine representation of the soul of Deep Root so far. So it's like, you know, <laughs> kind of got a point. I try not to, to derive sick pleasure in picking on Deep Root, but it is, it is absolutely kind of fascinating for me, this company. Um, I, 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 I hope they pull out. I hope they have a, a, a really good game at the end of the day. I hope that they can be a, a pinball company that's innovating and making new games because 
who doesn't want to see more pinball? It's just kind of mind blowing. Listen, you guys got to get a fucking marketing person in there. Who you got to hire if you're spending money, hire a marketing person, hire a communication person, hire a, a, a PR person. My God, Kevin, you throw us some money or something. Kevin and I will just <laughs> tell you that these are bad ideas. You're thinking of something. Reach out to me and Kevin. We can negotiate a price and we'll tell you if it's a terrible idea. Okay. Up or down. You'll save yourself money in the end. <laughs> something. Just do something for God's sakes. It just kills me. All right. Yeah. All right. So. There you go. That's the Christmas present is uh, getting in one more uh, deep root Raza commentary before the end of the year. There you go. There you go. Uh, all right. So um, Nick, you put this last bullet on there. Why don't you, why don't you talk about it? Uh, update to playfield chipping. So uh, I, I felt that that was a good podcast that we had last month. I think that it's, I was going back and looking at the YouTube videos and it's one of the most kind of thumbs up podcasts that we've done in, in quite some time. Um, and I've had people reach out to me and say that they really appreciate it. And it was helpful and all that good stuff. So I pat myself on the back a little bit. Um, I had, I want to provide an update on, on that podcast without saying too much. So Two days after that podcast, um, I was put in touch with someone high up in Stern, I'm not going to say who it was. And it was an off the record conversation. So I cannot talk about details of the conversation. I'm only mentioning this because one thing that I've highlighted and said when I'm talking about that is it seems like we don't get any communication on this issue from you know, any of the pinball companies that's happening with. And that can seem like they don't care, right? I'm not saying, and I, I think I explicitly said, I'm not saying that they don't care. That's just how it can feel and seem sometimes, right? When we don't hear anything about it and the problem keeps on happening. So my distributor said, I think you should talk to this person at, at, at Stern. This person spent an hour and 15 minutes with me on a Saturday talking about things and was very gracious and was very understanding and very nice. And this person didn't change my situation. It's not like they gave me a new Deadpool play field or anything like that. It was just kind of explaining what's going on. But what I want, I, and again, I can't go into details, but all I can say is for people following along in this is I left with the impression that Stern does care. Um, I, I, I definitely was conveyed to me that they do care about the issue. So that was nice. And hopefully me communicating that to everybody helps a little bit. I'm still sticking with everything I said is valid in terms of protecting yourself and, and waiting and making sure and checking forums. Uh, but I wanted to share that messaging with everybody. It's good. That's encouraging, man, that, you know, somebody would take their, their time out to, to sit down and explain it like that. And hopefully, hopefully more, more companies are willing to do something like that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so All right. there you go. Excellent. So there's your, there's your updates for the, for the week. Month. Oh, you know, one more but, thing I, I okay. will say, and I can say, because this was communicated into, I don't think I mentioned this on the last podcast. Um, this was, n this was not the, uh, uh, off the record conversation. This was in an email with, um, Stern and, um, you know, the, the folks that you reach out to and support. And when I was going to get my playfield issue remedied back in, uh, February, February, maybe, um, the way that Stern does this, for those not aware, is, is they basically have a committee that takes a look at the pictures and they have some criteria and then they decide like if you get a if you get nothing or a blank playfield or a populated playfield. So I just want to bring that up. Okay, uh, I think that's that's one thing that was left off from that conversation. For sure, yeah. That's, I remember when I had my Ghostbusters, um, I had one that just had a few like little sliver kind of insert ghost uh, uh, sections. Uh, and I sent in some pictures, and they're like, "Yeah, we can't do anything for that." And I don't blame them at all. It's like I wouldn't have really expected it, but it was such a huge thing with Ghostbusters that I sent it in just to see what would happen. And yeah, yeah. it you needed to have a certain number of of issues on the playfield for them to consider. Yeah, I mean, it's nice that it's not it, it's not done arbitrarily. So that's good. I mean, I think people like to know that there's some fairness in place. So. Sure, for sure. All right, so we got into game room updates a little bit during the the Mark interview with uh, <laughs> when his dog needed to go out. But um, so yeah, I rearranged my room a little bit. Um, two other things, I got some video game stuff to talk about. So um, I got there's a new thing for the Jaguar because I know everybody loves talking about the Jaguar. So uh, a new cart for the Jaguar, the Jaguar GD that lets you load all, the whole library onto one cartridge, so I can have like my whole collection 
in there at all times at the ready drop of a hat. I can play whatever the heck I want. It's really cool. And shout out to the girl geek for, uh, for hooking me up with that. Cause they're kind of hard to find right now, but she was able to, to track one down for me. So that's been fun. I've been, been dumping carts on an old, uh, PC through a parallel port. <laughs> so, uh, fun, another fun pandemic project. So that's been good. Um, but those are supposed to be coming out relatively soon through, uh, if you're in the U S through Atari age, you can get on a mailing list if that's something you're interested in. Um, the other thing, if we want to go even further down the weird video game, obscure rabbit hole is a system called the new one, which is, I ran a new on fan site back in like 2000 and Third. still the, uh, Oh shit. It's not muted. It's the authoritative site for all things new on. It had like <laughs> eight games came out for this platform. Uh, one of them was, so Cliff's Notes version, it's a, it's a chip in DVD players that played video games. They hoped that it would replace the, like the MPEG encoder and all of the DVD players. And eventually it would be ubiquitous and it would Trojan horse and you'd have video games on every DVD player. It never played out because PlayStation two came and said, Hey, we play DVDs too. And then everybody just bought that. Um, but one of the games that came out on it was iron soldier three, which never really saw a mass release. So I've been helping with Songbird Productions to put this out. Um, I provided them with the the file so they could create the new masters. They're going to re-release this game. So if anybody out there has any interest in this, it's probably like maybe one person, if that. Um, keep an eye out. He's going to be putting a pre-order list up, and you can get it in on that. And uh, so there you go. So there's a weird, obscure video game game room update for me. All right. Well, I, I, I don't have much other than my, my pinball struggles are real. <laughs> um, I've got four games down. Now, Iron Man's gone down. There's, uh, the optos aren't working. I tried oh to God. just unplug, replug, and that's into it. So I got to figure that out. But again, I, I can't even raise my play fields up to work on games. So I've got to wait till the pandemic's over. I thought about, I'm getting desperate, Kevin. So I thought about like getting that um, lift from Harbor Freight that everybody loves. Uh-huh. They, they kind of, it's like 180 bucks. Right. Um, I have one. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, what I could, what I thought about could do is like, oh, I can get that lift, jack my pinball machine up, take the legs off and lower it a little bit. Now, I, you know, most people are using that not for that purpose, but just to move games around. I, I'm definitely not, I, I thought about it more. I was like, man, I'm just not going to do that. I'm not comfortable with relying on that lift to take the legs off. It's one thing moving around with the legs on because if that lift breaks or something like that, the hydraulic thing shuts down. Then, then it will just fall on the legs and you should be okay. But to have the whole pinball machine just supported by that, possibly tipping over, possibly the, the – I it's just uh, knowing my luck, my pinball machine will go crashing to the floor and just be – you know, I'd have a bigger problem than, than just waiting. So uh, the struggle goes on, Kevin. Yeah. It's, a little de- it's a little depressing, but, you know, that's where I'm at. I would recommend if you do do that, like take the legs off and then just lower it all the way down and work on it like that so then you're not – you're not relying on the on the hydraulic to hold it. It would be all the way sure. up. Sure. Um, and then just jack it back up when you're done working on the game. Sure. Maybe maybe that could work. Um, and then as far as like uh, like getting under the games, the, the trick with that Harbor Freight card is you can't, without modifying it, you can't put it under the front of the games and yeah. move them. So yeah. you'd either have to get at it from the side or like pull your game out and, and do it that way. Can you uh, have you lifted those up with like a Jersey Jack game? Oh yeah, they're so heavy. The P three is the yeah. heaviest thing I have, and it, and you've, it yeah, and you've that jacked up. it up. And That's how fun. I set up all my games. Is I, I psh, lower them onto that and psh, jack it up. Yeah. But then it's not on there for an extended period of time when I'm doing that. I'm just putting the legs on it. Yeah, that's the thing. I, I I'm really scared of sometimes when you try to solve one problem, you cause a bigger one. For so for I, you, I, think, I could see. Yeah, I would I, I would recommend not doing that. I know it's just <laughs> not. It's I I have to take a step back and. It's not worth it, so I'll I'll I'll, I'll just wait. Uh, Zachariah Pinball is in the chat. What's up? Speaking of which, um, I think this Thursday we're gonna play some Zachariah Pinball uh, with the Bros. So, uh, I think uh, oh me, boy. you, Martha. She's gonna play on a computer. Wow. Yeah, Martha's playing video wow. games, and then uh, maybe Jeffrey. Nice. Jeff can handle. It. He's an IT professional. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we're looking forward to that. We haven't done that since the uh, the springtime. So. Yeah, I want to thank Zachariah for hooking us up with some tables so we can bring that to you guys. Heck yeah, that'll be fun. And uh, we, and they said we got some giveaways. Ooh. So, so this we'll, Thursday. We'll give us some tables. Thursday. That's the plan. Thursday, 8 o'clock Eastern. It'll be like old school bro, except on Zoom and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as close as we can get right now. All right. Close this out, Kevin. Do the right. social media stuff. That's right. If you, if you want to learn more and, and stay in touch between shows, 
check us out on social media. We're on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. If you want to see old streams and Tuna put up a new tutorial video for Stern Star Trek. So he shot a tutorial video before he uh, sold it. So check that out on YouTube. Um, yeah. You can email us, talkpinball at gmail.com. If you want your comments, questions, feedback to get to us, that's a good way to do it. Uh, if you want to support the channel, you can subscribe right here on Twitch if you're watching live or use your Twitch Prime or it's Prime Gaming now, I think they call it, um, to support the channel at no extra cost if you got Amazon Prime. Um, you can send us some PayPal. We got a PayPal link. Or you can uh, drop us a review uh, for a holiday cheer. You know, do something uh, nice for the bros. Uh, you know, review the podcast. Tell a friend. So, the tell spirit them, of giving. Yeah. Tell them, you know, they, they talk to this smart guy who does all these awesome uh, voices. And uh, then they talked about Deep Root. So who wouldn't want to hear that? <laughs> <laughs> the highs and the lows. That's right. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is uh, you know, probably our last podcast of 2020. We'll see you guys in 2021. You can join us again for uh, uh, a virtual bro on Thursday. But uh, everybody, continue to stay safe. It's really, it's really tough. You never know what somebody's going through. Mm -hmm. um in life in general especially during a pandemic so so be nice to people and uh thanks again to mark silk for coming on that was that was a lot of fun man uh and we'll catch you next time yeah maybe maybe in 2021 we'll have a, a, a real in life bro show maybe i'm hoping i think so i, th I think it, in, it's like fall 2021 we'll be back i hope be so. back in action all right <laughs> stay tuned take care right. happy holidays happy new year and uh we'll see you next time